Tonight on episode one of Expressions Podcast, we'll be talking with an amazing guy and someone who I've wanted to have a real conversation with for a really long time. Uh, he's had his own podcast. He's done live Instagrams every Thursday night with some of the most incredible conversations. He's as honest as it gets and one of the few people I've met who actually listens. Brendan Caulfield. <laughs> All right, so this is episode one. I'm Brian Weiss. Uh, my friends and I have gotten together to talk about some really cool, uh, to talk to some really cool people uh, that we feel are great at expressing themselves, great at getting their point across and, and showing the world how they are creative and all their little talents that they have. We're going to talk to some people that I respect, and the person we have here tonight is a person I, I respect a lot, and I can't wait to get into the conversation with Brendan, but we'll do that after we talk to the other host for a quick second. Um, again, I'm Brian Weiss. I run Day Tripper Photo. I've been doing all kinds of fun stuff as far as uh, podcasts and that, but this is the first time I'm working with such a cool group of people talking to some awesome people. So uh, why don't we first say hi to Mark. Mark, you're right beside me here. Hey, Brian. How are you tonight? Awesome, man. Awesome. I'm so excited. Episode one. Yeah, episode one. It's our first one, and uh, we've got a great guest who I've just met for the first time uh, five minutes ago when we went live, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, coming up. Cool. Ryan, how are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing awesome, man, and I'm extremely excited for tonight's guest because obviously Brendan and I go very far back. We've known each other now for about two years and have done a multitude of podcasts spanning I don't know, about eight hours at this stage. <laughs> so I need to say I'm very excited for tonight. It's like you've been talking to him almost as much as I play Skyrim. <laughs> hours, hours and hours wasted on that game. Aurora, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I couldn't be better. Couldn't <laughs> be better. Um, I'm excited so for tonight's uh, podcast. I'm excited to learn more about wrestling because I don't know a whole lot about it. So. <laughs> Well, it's true, because when we were talking on episode zero, I mean, there was three photographers and Ryan, who has uh, the podcasting and the journalism and all that background. But the conversation really kind of hovered around photography a lot. And I'm really happy that uh, our first guest has nothing to do with photography, although your podcasting and your video work and all the things that you're doing uh, is a completely different avenue of creativity that takes a special way of thinking. It takes a special... A desire to keep doing it. So, Brendan, how have you been, man? Good to see you. Hey, I, I actually love the flow of this because I am a fan of podcasts. So, the more different like formats and different, this is more of a panel thing. It's awesome. Like, I know two of you really well. I just met two of you five minutes ago, so I can't wait for however long we chat to really get to know each other more. But I've been doing. All right. And I like the way that you said special kind of thinking where I get motivated when I see great photographers or people that are like, I don't want to just say artists because I think like there's a lot of art. So like people specifically like Jimmy the ref doing a whole bunch of art right now of drawing and stuff. And like I see all that and I'm like, I'm not good in those rounds, but I use that for motivation for me to do my stuff of just going, oh, well, that gave my creative juices flowing. So I enjoy seeing different artists and their own techniques. So I'm doing all right, though. I'm doing all right. Awesome. And that's a really good point. I mean, that's one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did on the show is just to bring in artists from all different genres. It doesn't it doesn't matter if you are a, a photographer or a woodworker. We're going to have break dancers on. We're going to have all kinds of different people from different genres because it's all about being a creative. And that's really what it comes down to. And I think all of us individually are love to be creative. And I think us doing this podcast is yet another extension of that. And I, how, how have you gotten into podcasting? How did that all start for you? Because obviously I originally met you as a wrestler. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden I find out you're doing these things from your car where you're interviewing people um, on road trips, which was the craziest conversation. Um, wrestling Wrestlers on road trips. I mean... <laughs> insight um so all the, all the awesome uh podcasting that you've done since and now of course on thursday nights you're on your instagram that's the one i'm watching most often but you've got your patreon as well and that's something i want to get into because uh for somebody to be successful with social media it's not just making videos and saying hey look at me mm -hmm. there's a lot more to it behind the scenes to actually make it worth your time so first off when did you find out you liked podcasting was it before or after wrestling 
so I've loved wrestling to any degree. I literally have action figures behind me and such where it's like I it's been the one thing I could say has that I've loved my whole life since at least 97, 96 when I'm about four or five are my first memories of like, OK, I remember what Stone Cold was doing then. And then literally podcasts. I there was Ontario indie wrestling podcast called The O Show in like 2007. I think they started 2005, 2000. And sevens when I found them though, and then Anthony Kingdom James did something on their network in like 2008 or nine, and then I found and Ryan Knight knows this where it's like I found Bite Radio which had Jason Agnew and a whole bunch of the other guys from Live Audio Wrestling at that time, and they were just talking about their week and their life and had nothing to do with wrestling. It was just about the people, and I ended up like basically ripping off that format in 2012. And if I could like sit down and map out because. I just renewed the domain name for the original podcast literally at the beginning of this month. And I first registered that nine years ago that I could like jot down, oh, the first episode we were supposed to watch WrestleMania in 2012 and then it got pushed to June. And then there's been like five or six iterations before I started doing This Is Brendan where uh, you should never ask people what their actual like opinions or thoughts of you were. And the only thing I knew is I had three questions. Right. I remember this. <laughs> yep. What was your first impression of me? What's your current impression of me? And what's like a goal for yourself? And then I, I kind of did it Colt Cabana style of sitting down and I formatted it to where there would be like one, three to four minute chat. And then the rest of it would be, we're going to be on a car ride. And there's a bunch of different Brendans, but my personal favorite is Exhausted Brendan. It's after a show, I'm just tired, and then that's where you get my honest opinions or my those inappropriate jokes that are just real funny or it's a real observational. That I was like, those are my favorite moments. So why not press record, put my phone where we where I would put it for when I'm saying GPS directions, but instead attach a little headphone jack microphone to it and chat. And the sound quality is not the best in that, but. I'm a firm believer, and this is what stops people from being creative, of it's the content quality, not the production quality. Because you can film a video that is in for 8K, just looks tremendous, but at the end of the day, if it's two girls, one cup, it's still two girls, one oh. cup. <laughs> so, oh but, but if you have something that the quality isn't there, but you get invested in the people, the quality can match it where it's once they get a bigger following they can pay for bigger production pay for this and now in in 2021 it's so easy like we're on Streamyard. i do my stuff on zoom people still do their stuff on skype there's all these different avenues and legitimately you can host podcasts without even paying for it monthly like personally i use anchor but when i started i was paying like 15 dollars a month from pod bean or something and so the barriers of entry are going down but then what gets people in their head is oh it doesn't sound as good as this or is this it's like no it doesn't need to sound that good you can get to that point and this is brendan is the first podcast that i've ever done more than 20 episodes of and i'm the batch of technically i think i'd be on episode like 83 right now of everything that hasn't been released fully but that's just you mentioned my patreon that's what the first three months of this year has been about setting in motion i thought i was going to do daily podcasts of just like turn on the microphone talk for five ten minutes about what's going on in my head maybe someone needs an affirmation of like not every day is the best but like just go through those 24 hours, take uh, take five to eight hours to go to sleep, and then wake up and hope the next day is better. And now it's become like I do a podcast with Kobe once a week where we're watching the last half hour of a show, and we're, we're very much – we're slightly inebriated, and we're just voicing our opinions <laughs> and just talking. And now I have a conspiracy theory podcast. I do a monthly one with Kingdom James where I'm like, between mine and this, I'm like, I'm not doing five, 10 minute episodes. I'm doing 30 minutes at least to five hours. Like until the conversation's done. Yeah. Well, and to your to your point earlier too, I just want to touch on this is that you had mentioned there's so many avenues right now that people can get involved with with podcasting. Whereas you were paying fifteen dollars a month. Nowadays there's all these free apps, there's all these free softwares that you can use. And like you had said, use those right now to get yourself better. You start there. You don't need to pay for that high quality sound at the beginning. You can start off on these free softwares and, and use that as a practice platform, mm -hmm. if nothing else. Bang out the first 20 episodes. Try to find your voice. Try to find what kind of sound you're looking for. And then you can pay for that high quality stream. You can pay for whatever it is you want to pay for. But 
like you had said, it's much better to start on these free softwares and just just start. Once you get yeah. started, you it's amazing what you'll create. One hundred percent. Yeah, I'm a friend of mine, Peter McKinnon. Always, that's the first thing he says whenever he does one of his um, videos. Whenever he's mentoring somebody, he always says, "Just do it." You know, don't mm -hmm. worry about the stuff. Don't worry about the camera. Just do it. If you have an idea, get it done. So it's the most important thing I think in any career path is just that first step, make it happen. And that's what we're doing here. You know, we're just trying something out, making it happen, talking to some mm -hmm. good people and seeing how, how we go. Um, how much time do you think you spend on social media? Uh, way too much time, especially during the pandemic of like, I'm just there, but before my sleep schedule wasn't the best. So I'd be random where it's now I get like, it might be from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. It might be from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m. I will get actual sleep, not a nap. And it's just <laughs> like it's paying attention. And when I am fully awake and aware at like 2 or 3 a.m. before I'm going to work and no one else is. And that's when people are tweeting the dumbest stuff and they think no one sees it or everyone else is very tired or not in the best state of mind at the moment. And I'm just looking at this. I'm like. They don't know I've seen this, but it's now in the universe. And that it, seeing all the wrongs other people do kind of helps me go towards the like I'll post long ass Facebook posts and people think I'm intelligent just because I could write three paragraphs. But the difference is it's because I'll register it and think and it'll actually come back to my challenge for people instead of just reacting where I feel like a lot of people react instead of think. You know what? That's one of the things that I was going to mention. Um, one of the things that I really, really wanted you on the show for was because you have an ability to listen, process, come up with proper answers and questions. And uh, I, I really witnessed that that one time that you had a Puff on your on your show mm -hmm. on Thursday. And out of the blue, Puff, by the way, Mark and Aurora uh, is a wrestler uh, from Buffalo. One of the most charismatic men you will ever meet. Absolutely. I mean, if, if there's charisma, he's like 200% beyond that. Like the guy is just <laughs> awesome. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if you question, does that have anything to do with your bumper sticker on your car? It is exactly my bumper sticker oh, on my okay. car. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have very many bumper stickers, but I've got a puff one. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, he was on your show and then all of a sudden out of left field, you invited his mother to talk. Yeah. Um, so Maybe you can kind of go over what happened with that conversation, if you remember that. So it's actually because I remember you specifically complimenting because someone put up a post like, who's a good interviewer or a podcaster that you're into? And you specifically said, Brendan's good because he was able to pivot to talking to Puff's mom, where what's funny is I sometimes I try to organize who I'm going to have on the Instagram lives. And it's my way of it's my way of recording a podcast, but also reminding myself people are going to listen, because when I record a podcast offline, I forget people will listen and I will talk because I enjoy talking to people like literally me and Mark just met. And I was asking him about his day. Uh, I would have asked Aurora a little more questions, but she was trying to get that badass sign in the background and I didn't <laughs> want to ruin it. But like, that's just, that's just me. Of I want to talk to everyone. I don't, I don't want to be the person yelling at everyone or the center of attention. I'd rather be in that cocktail hour of going table to table and just having chats with people. And everyone has an individual moment instead of listening to a speaker or something and just be like, Oh yeah, that's what they're telling us. And what's funny is I, I wanted to do a couple Instagram lives that were open lines because also mentioning how some podcasts, they think they have someone on and they have to do an interview where it's, podcasting is great when it's a conversation that you're like yeah. eavesdropping in and i want to do where i'm like it's open lines if i see you watching especially if you're a patreon member it's literally okay well i'll invite you on or i'll chat with anyone i'm just like who's here invite okay cool and just have a chat and literally i was white i was wrapping up and then puff just randomly watched it and i was like oh well puff you want to come on and he was in the middle of setting up his new studio so we we're chatting I hear his mom in the background, I'm like, oh, well, I want to talk to her. And because I I indulge in listening to my friends' endeavors, like, I can't wait to listen to this podcast when it comes on, especially episode zero. Uh, so I, I, I'm not good with things that are important, like 
birthdays or names, but I'll remember random stuff. Like I, I will meet a girl on Tinder. This is clearly like four or five years ago. And we will, well, I will meet up with her for coffee. A couple weeks later, we'll go on another date. And I, I might forget something she said about herself, but I'll remember a random story she said about her brother or something. And, uh, and she'll just be like, my brother. I'm like, Oh, this one. It's like, yeah. And I just realized why I don't remember names too well. It's because back in 2010, when Google Glass was supposed to be a thing, and we would just look at people and like their Facebook bio would pick up. I think my brain went, sweet. I don't need to remember names anymore because <laughs> I'm going to be in a minority report situation. <laughs> and now it's 2021. And there's a lot of, hey, man, how's it going? I'm not going to say hi, I'm Brendan, because I don't know if we've met before. <laughs> <laughs> I think so that's a lot of Mercedes drivers. <laughs> So just ahead, to corroborate right? his story real quick, every time uh, that we've done podcasts together, my memory isn't the strongest. I have, I have a fairly decent memory, but he will come over and uh, bring up things that we've talked about. And again, when we hang out, it'll be six, seven hours of just nonstop conversation from beginning to end. And then press end. record. <laughs> and yeah. then press record, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he'll come up and say these things like, oh, remember we talked about this, this, and this. And I'm like, Man, how do you remember me bringing this up? Because I don't even remember telling you this story. Level well, I don't remember interest. talking about this. So it's it's incredible that your memory is honestly that strong. Even though you can't remember names, I can't remember anything. So kudos to you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Even like small, because I've also now realized I don't need to remember specific things. Because also people don't remember what happened. They remember how they felt about that True. moment. That's why exactly, a lot of times yeah. when you think of exes or relationships that didn't end well, you're remembering all the picnic dates, not all the bickering after the bar where it's like, uh, where it's, I'm interested in people and I'm genuinely like, oh, why would I want, especially in the world of wrestling, at least there aren't a lot of individual experiences. So a lot of wrestlers aren't the best to have conversations with. So I will go to the photographer. I'll go to the music people because you're not in this sphere all the time that you'll have different experiences. I love asking people opinions of my matches that aren't in wrestling just to see how they engage with it. Like my promos are very weird. I show them to my coworkers. I'm like, what do you think of this? And they just go, are you hiding a dead body? This is very creepy. <laughs> Well, you do have a, a coffin, so that would and be... And two uh, mannequins. Yes. <laughs> Those have been my pandemic so, purchases. People are getting married and home. married. This, this <laughs> seems like a great really well. time. This seems like a great time to toss it over to Mark and Aurora now if they have any questions for Holmes, because that's a segue that I want to see. <laughs> so I, I, I've had a couple of questions uh, floating around in my mind, and the first one is, is you, you talked about... Um, how you'll talk to anybody. And, and of course, you've got a podcast and sometimes they go on for hours. Um, and when when you start a podcast, like when, when you think about, okay, I'm going to start my podcast, whether it's a daily or a weekly one, uh, do you have a subject in mind or do you just... Um, to just start the podcast, start talking to whoever it is you're you're speaking with that day, and then the, and then it just sort of generically or organically grows into the conversation. So when I started podcasting originally, I totally ripped off Byte Radio. I stole their format, I stole everything, and it was me and a few of my buddies getting together to have conversations. We we knew we couldn't interview anyone because we were just nineteen year olds working at Cineplex, like. And then what's funny is we're talking about our week and we're talking about our life. But at that time, none of us drank, none of us did anything, anything. And literally it was a boring conversations. And then we started actually going out and having experiences, but then we didn't have time to record the podcast. And it was this weird, like almost Schrodinger's cat of like, is it happening or is it not happening? And then it just led to me constantly trying to do that with other people. And those podcasts were always called GTA Wire. And then it became... Okay, the only person I can rely on is myself. So I want to do a weekly podcast. Uh, I'm going to call it This is Brendan because I'm asking people their opinions of me. But also, we're going down side, side stories of random stuff. Like, me and Tarek recorded a podcast. He's another local wrestler. And there was, like, a trailer that tipped over, and it had a bunch of cows. So we were talking about being stuck on this on-ramp for, like, hours. There's one dude, and I still remember this vividly. This was, like, three or four years ago. There's one dude that fell asleep in his car because this is also, like, 11 – or not 11, 1.30 a.m. in the morning. And he slumped over, like, JFK after he got shot. Oh, my crazy. God. We're like, homie's out. Like, guys, his seatbelt <laughs> Too soon. Too yeah. soon. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> literally, his seatbelt was just holding him up suspended. It's just like – 
and those are just fun moments and experiences and that's why like i've recorded so much like vlog type footage but it's basically home videos at this moment of me and my friends all just like hanging out or going to a road trip for wrestling but we're also going to go to this toy store and go toy hunting and all this just randomness and literally i i'm a fan of podcasts i listen to a lot of them i listen from the mainstream like joe rogan interviews to like uh five minutes the bottom of the barrel like mine <laughs> well, so yeah i would listen to like, yeah. <laughs> lower i would listen to like more niche stuff like ryan knight as he's coming up in the interviews to joe rogan and then also i'm listening to a podcast called before breakfast which is a five minute monday to saturday ish podcast of how to how your work can impact your life easier how to balance it out and like there's a lot of family stuff on there and it's a podcast not too many people know about and then there's a bunch of local guys that have podcasts like this is going to go into my rotation i know and it's just being so open to everything instead of i don't watch sports so i don't fully understand just sitting down and watching a sports game i need to somewhat engage or i need to do whatever where it's sports is so out of my control like I can't vote for someone to be on the team or the starting lineup, but if people don't attach with a wrestler, he's probably not going to be on the roster in six months. It's like, sorry, bro, you're not going to get a title run. And I like that interaction. I'd rather spend time here. I don't know how long this podcast is going to go for because I talk a lot, but I'd rather talk to new people. And now what's funny, it's I've started because I've done five hour podcasts with people because I'm just catching up, especially during the pandemic. A lot of people aren't talking and video chatting very important being able to see each other while chatting very important but i've also had hour-long phone calls of just someone venting or we're just like oh how was your weekend we did nothing but we still talked for an hour and literally for my podcast though interviewing now there's been a few where i will have one question i want to ask and i am uh, someone asked what would a warning label be uh for myself and i say uh aggressively passionate so I might come off like a bit like of a my cat. <laughs> yes, I I am a cat that cuddles pretty much. <laughs> like my cat doesn't cuddle at all, but he's always within eyes reach of me. I think he's waiting for me to die so he can like taste me. But um, <laughs> literally, it's I come off sometimes a little strong or rude. But if you put in the work of filtering it out, you go, oh, he has the best of intentions. He's not coming off as cocky or arrogant. He's coming off as angry that everyone's just accepting the wrong way is the right way when there are morals involved and it's like, well, I don't think it has to be this way. And literally there's been a couple podcasts where I have one loaded question that might come off rude from why do you think if you've been in wrestling longer than me, you're not more successful. Or also there's been someone recently and the podcast will be up where she recently did something that might be out of the ordinary. And some people might be sensitive to talk about. And I figured out my way to wiggle around it. And she was just very open about it. But from the why aren't you further, which is a little uh, accusatory, I wait. It took me an hour and 45 minutes to answer that because I didn't want to just start off aggressive and just being like, well, like you haven't accomplished anything. It's like, no, I want to get into your mind. How do you see things? How do I see things? And then progress from there. Perfect. So I have a couple questions more related to wrestling. Uh, than podcast because no worries. I thank you. You beat me to it, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, for those of the people who are listening who might not know you, um, what was? I've got two parts to the question. First of all, like, what is your wrestling character? Because I know that there's a character <laughs> involved in wrestling. The persona. Um, uh, it's very performance based and that type of thing with athletics. And second part of the question is, what made you fall in love? wrestling so i i can go with like i don't know what led me to fall in love with wrestling i think it's maybe people or i want to say males but literally i just found out recently of how naive i was that when i was 12 i didn't think girls could be nerds i'm just like what because i i started thinking in myself i i became closer friends with uh, some females that are the biggest nerds and you wouldn't expect them they're the most like they look like fitness models, but they're nerdy as all hell. Like they're big. I'm wearing a George Costanza Seinfeld reference shirt. I have action figures behind me. I'm kind of a nerd, but these girls would out nerd me. And I go, 
Wait, why am I surprised that she likes Pokemon? When I was 12 watching Yu-Gi-Oh, did I not think that she was also watching this stuff on YTV The Zone? Did I think, like, she, when I'm learning magic tricks in my mirror, did I just think, oh, little girls are just, their hobbies are looking cute and pretty? Like, I'm like, why was I so naive to not think this? Which is what I love about 2021, about people from their gender identity to sexual orientation to their loves and passions. The reason why Nerdov became popular in the last 13 years is everyone that felt like the outcast just realized, oh, we're all like that from the jocks to the weird goth kids that you're afraid are gonna shoot up the school. They're all nerds, they all got something. They got Funko Pops, they got books, they got something. Photography is a nerdum where it's, yeah, it's once you're into something, you're a nerd about it. and. I think you're more interesting for having a passion or a hobby to get into. And wrestling just happened to be my thing. And I never grew out of it. It was my escape. I got to live through Stone Cold Steve Austin telling the authority to screw off. Like, there's all these things where I'm just like, okay, this is just fun. And then you're also watching people beat each other up. And you know it's not real. So you know people are able to, like, wake up the next morning where it's like, me and my buddy Kobe Durris have started watching <laughs> like the best of UFC fights before a weekly wrestling show. And these people come out looking like aliens of how much bruising is on their face oh. and their head. And just like, it's like, yeah, it's cool that these people are fighting. And then you're like, that dude's going to be in the hospital for a week. Like yeah. it, there's a little enjoyment that gets taken out of it uh, for that element. So like with wrestling it just became the thing of, it's always just been there. And then I look back, I'm like, oh, well, it's been there for 22 years when I have family problems or life isn't going my way. I knew Monday nights I could turn on Raw. I could watch whatever. And then I could find wrestling stuff. And it was just the nerdum I picked. Do I wish I was more of a, of a like a uh, drawer or an artist that way? Hell yeah. There was a point when I was 13, I was really good at it. And then I decided to stop and I've now broke both of my hands at least once. So my mm. artwork isn't as good. So I use expression in other ways, but then, so my character, <laughs> I'm a, uh, the Holden Albright <laughs> character. I, if I gave just a one sentence thing would be pro wrestler, amateur criminal. And I'm basically, I, what's it called? How do I describe this? I'm inspired by like found footage of like crime scenes. And when like someone does a manifesto over a camera, I, this photo is great for the fact that I randomly grabbed a kid's action figure toys and I bit the head off one of them and spit it back. Can't do that in the COVID times now. Oh, and that so kid funny. now has that experience because like I have the Illuminati symbol on my chest there of just like making it a little more creepy. And I'm inspired. Some people are inspired by horror movies. I'm inspired by like Charles Manson. <laughs> and like the, the main in inspiration for my video promos because I make them look like crime scene evidence tapes. I don't go, you see on March 7th in Barry Wrestling, we're going to go toe to toe. No, I, I tell people I don't care about winning or losing. I, re I care about being remembered. And remembering could be in your victories, but I'm looking to be remembered through my victims and my opponents of the scars. And the shot's so perfect of just that head. Cause the funny story about me grabbing these toys, cause I don't, I don't think things through all the time. And it's, there's this little child, he's booing me. So I'm doing my job, right? I'm a bad guy. I'm a heel. And I just see he's holding action figures. So I'm going to grab it. And I just have the action figures in my hand. I'm like, well, what do I do now? I'm like, I'm going to bite the head off of it. Okay. And luckily a fan, Greg Krause, built it. But then also in crossbody, this is how I look when I come out. There's a bloody handprint on my jacket. It's ripped off. I got this big, I'm already like 250 to 275, depending on the week, where I have the big wolf mask on. And then I wrestle very violently that there's all these things. But also there was one candidate in Barry where on the first day I was a bad guy. So I scared the bejesus out of this child. And the next day I was a good guy and I gave a little fist bump to the child. And that's one of the things that, especially in my home promotion of crossbody pro wrestling, where I have the heavyweight championship, I, I got a little soft because there's a lot of children that are fans there. And especially for some reason, little girls. And I'm like the main guy there. And I'm supposed to be this weird horror movie creature, this true crime mastermind. And I'm taking photos with these children. I'm getting down on one knee, asking them, how is their day going? Oh, are they doing good in school? But then also if the kid comes up and wants to play into the character, 
his experience with me at the merch table is going to be me threatening to burn down his house. This is literally how it breaks down. It's it's almost like a stand-up bit for me at this point, where the best stand-up comedians make it seem like it's a conversation, makes it seem like it's just their thoughts, not that they've performed that same two-minute monologue a thousand times. And what happens is a little kid will come up, and sometimes I'll have candles and a Ouija board set up to my T-shirt and photos. It's like a whole experience. And what ends up happening is this kid will be like, I'm not afraid of you. I'm like, that's okay. He's like, well, I think you suck. I'm like, oh, really? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, how do you like living in your house? It's like, what? It's like, yeah, it'd be a shame if someone burnt it down. And then they get Ooh, terrified. Like and they're like, yeah. And they're like, you don't know where I live. So I reply, you don't know how much free time I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So like, what's the youngest that you've ever threatened? How, how young are we talking here? Like, are we talking like five, six years old? Are you, whenever, are you giving kids nightmares? They, oh, 100% <laughs> nightmares, especially one kid who didn't like the Ouija board. I didn't even have to say anything. He just realized, oh, Ouija board, that's evil. And just <laughs> that got in his head. But literally, the, my favorite experience was one person. And uh, <laughs> she was like, you don't know where I live. I tell her, you don't know how much free time I have. She replies, well, I have two houses. And I reply with, well, if I also created you, I wouldn't love the person I created you with. And this is the most, their parent is right next to them. And I basically said, I understand why your parents aren't together. And the oh, parent wow. laughed. But the parent laughed because now this child has this experience. Luckily, like they didn't go into all the <laughs> self doubt, but like that's way better than. Oh, I saw because there's so many things. You saw the photo of me coming out where it's oh, there was that big dude with the wolf mask. Oh, there's that big dude that delayed it. It's like there's that big dude that threatened to burn down my house. These are all little stories now that they get to grow with that it means more that they can't wait till the next month. And they're they're like, Oh, I got him this time. I'm gonna say something funny, but they're like five to eight. Like they can't think quickly enough. It takes them five to six weeks. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. There's a couple of things that I've wanted to ask and go over since we, we were talking about you talking to Puff's mom, because I still want to get back to that. But yeah, you're 250, 275 on any given day, but you're still able to do a moonsault off the top rope in wrestling. You know, Here's the thing. We all know wrestling is um, an art form more than it, let's just call it the sport, where there's mm -hmm. a there's a winner and that winner you know, one type of thing. Um, but it's a complete art form. And we've even talked about how memory isn't your strong point. When you work out an entire match with what, 10, 15 minutes ahead of time, and you literally have cues where you have to recall, okay, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. Memory is a lot more than you, you might be playing it off as. You have the ability to uh, call a match. I've seen you at the beginning of a match, like working it out ahead of time, especially back when we did the Christmas thing for Barry wrestling in November, um, that match, you were not the winner. Uh, it, he didn't make you out to be a great dude. And yet you're the one that was organizing it and calling it and saying, okay, we're going to do this. And when I'm down, you're going to do this move. So wrestling is a completely different mindset than people think it is. And it's a lot more creative than people give it credit for. Ryan and I both know this. Mark has been to a wrestling event, hasn't really experienced the whole drama behind it. But Aurora, this is all new for you. Yeah, never watched wrestling, never been to a wrestling match. The only experience of wrestling I've ever had is talking to Brian about it. I talk about it a lot. <laughs> I do. Where do you live, Aurora? Uh, in Newmarket. <laughs> Okay, well, like, I hope that you can make it out to one of the shows. I'll make sure, uh, <laughs> even if it's not a Barry wrestling event, I'll make sure that you can get tickets and you're very comfortable. Just message me ahead of time because okay. I, I fight really hard for the independence because you can watch the WWE and the experience there live versus on TV is almost worse than on TV because you don't mm -hmm. get the camera cuts. You don't get to see everything great you, commentary yeah like that was a big thing for my dad my dad loves commentary where i i could give or take commentary i love the action at, at, as it is and that's where also like now that i literally that line just made me think I'm like <laughs> there are some wrestlers that the matches aren't good because they're thinking of it as how would commentary put this together but if you don't have the commentary and you're trying to rely on that thing it's not gonna work uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so Mark, do you have a question that uh, kind of? Yeah, I just after uh, after you're done uh, that point, um, I thought it was something that Brian had said. So go ahead. Uh, so I wrestling 
I don't know what people think at this point. I can't even play wrestling video games anymore because my mind is, how would I structure this? It's very much like telling a story. And I compare it to, it's more of a movie or like a TV show. It's almost a sh- uh, like a 90 minute or two hour wrestling show. It's almost like an anthology television series where there's all these stories going on and mm-hmm. maybe they connect, but maybe they don't. And now you're just sitting there to just enjoy it. And it's laying out of... There could be one match that's only four minutes long. There's a match that's 45 minutes long, and it just depends on everything. And from the outside, yeah, it's the winners and losers are important in wrestling for the story you're telling. But also what's more important is the beginning, middle, end of this person can win, but if the match didn't look good and this person is supposed to win because they're going to challenge for the heavyweight championship – you want that heavyweight championship to be one of the best matches on the show. That's why you put it on last. And if this person's match is just all them or anything where it's like the fans aren't going to care. And that's the fav- my favorite part about wrestling. It's, we we now know cheat codes also. When you wrestle long enough, you know if the crowd's down, we can kind of do this to get their energy up because they're going to be shocked and awe. And it's literally just that. It's a production. There's a beginning, middle, end to each story. And you, the one thing I didn't realize before I got into wrestling was – you you don't go into the night going, you want to know what? Sean Gibson, who's a promoter at Barry, I want to wrestle 35 minutes tonight. No, you show up to the venue and Sean Gibson's like, okay, you have a 10-minute match. And that's the thing of you don't have this unlimited time because you also have to think it's a two-hour show for everyone. If you have eight matches on the show and everyone's wrestling five minutes, if you're going to be like, oh, well, that was a real short show. But if everyone's wrestling 30 minutes, you're like, when is this over? <laughs> And it's so different it's everywhere you go. Yeah. If you go to Crossbody, you're going to get a completely different storyline. You're going to get a completely different backstory. You're going to get a completely different amount of time that you're going to wrestle because you hold a higher stature or lower stature. Mm-hmm. Um, everywhere you go is so completely different. Everybody you wrestle is so completely different. It's such a, a challenging thing. I, I think, I mean, I'm approaching an age that there's absolutely impossible for me to get into wrestling. But if I had started when I was young enough in my twenties or something like that, or even earlier, like most people, (laughs) um, that would be the part that I think would trip me up the most is remembering the moves and keeping people safe and doing it in a way that, you know, you don't have to worry that uh, nobody will want to work with you ever again. Right. Yeah. And that's, that was the thing that funnily enough, I forgot that you mentioned the memory of literally it's, the way I plan my matches, if you watch it carefully and you watch a lot of my matches, you'll realize I'm I'm very a reactive wrestler. Like, I don't want to have someone position me or I don't want to constantly position people like, oh, I want you here, so I'm going to put you here. I'm like, I want you there, so I'm just going to hit you really hard until you're staggered and you fall that way. Or, like, there's one match, and what's funny is, People will plan this extraordinary match and then they're going to forget it two minutes in because they don't remember 18 minutes later. And I was just going to say, I'm it. sure you've been out there multiple times and been in the ring and had all this elaborate stuff planned. And all of a sudden you're just calling random stuff on the fly at that point because it's just you feel at the crowd, you feel at the moment, right? Is that? And yeah, pretty Ricky forgets. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I know, Mark, Mark, I know you had a question as well there. Yeah, I did. Actually, I want to back up a little bit. So, um, Brian, uh, a few minutes ago, you actually said that wrestling wasn't a sport, um, that it's a, it's an art form and it's expressionism. So I, I, I'm going to challenge that because uh, I definitely think that wrestling is a sport. It's um, athletic. As, yeah, because it's, it's athletic. athletic. No, no, no different. Uh, actually, uh, like gymnasts and figure skaters, um, uh, dancers, they're, they're all expressionism and they all have a program that they choreograph to. And that's what you do. Um, although with many of those disciplines – I'm not sure they could do what they do and then take a hit. Because, I, I mean, I, I'm not a, a, a person that's watched wrestling a lot, but I have seen my fair share of matches. <laughs> uh, and and there are some of those things, whether it's choreographed or not, has to hurt. Like, and, and uh, like I could not do what you do. Like, I, that picture that Brian just showed with, uh, with you going off the top rope and, and in the air, uh, that is just an amazing picture. And I think to myself, yeah, if I did that, I'd be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life because it would not end well for me. So how how do you feel like, um, do you feel that wrestling is a sport um, or do you feel that it's more just a show for you? 
So what's funny is you can't really see it too well, but I, you saying, oh, I don't know how some people would be able to remember a whole like floor exercise for gymnasts and take a hit where it's, you haven't seen me wrestle. And I am one of the most car crash violent wrestlers in the area. I literally have, I broke half of my tooth because I got, there's a move called a choke slam, which is where someone literally lifts you up from your throat. And this dude was seven feet tall. So he threw me at least eight feet tall because of full extension, but also on the ring apron to the floor. And there was a guardrail set up and we were too short to where the guardrail flipped over, hit me in the face and okay. broke half of my tooth. It stabbed the referee, Jimmy, actually, I mentioned earlier, he's an artist friend and a referee I know of it literally stabbed him in the neck. I was just like, that terrified me more. I literally had a piece of my tooth hanging off of my lip. And I looked at Jimmy's neck bleeding. I'm like, bro, are you okay? And that's the person I am where I rather care about everyone else. And literally, it's I, I started this by saying I don't watch sports. But I watch a lot of wrestling. And the way Brian said it's athletic. I think a lot of people are trained to not like the word fake. Because it's just in the ether now of don't call wrestling fake. Yeah, wrestling isn't fake. It's an art form. No one ever looks at a TV or a movie and go, that's fake. Because that's, it's just assumed. It doesn't need to be pointed out. Of I think sports, there's a winner or it can be graded. In pro wrestling, it's an art form. And you could like one thing, not like another. But the greater story is the story. If you watch... Grey's Anatomy over like 25 episodes. It's all the stories. You don't really care. I want to combat that, honestly. I, I do want to combat that point. I think wrestling is a sport in the sense that as a as a wrestler, you guys are competing for a spot. Regardless, but we're not. A thousand percent you are. Now, you might not be. You might not be. But there are a lot of wrestlers out there. And there are a lot of wrestlers that are competing to make it to the WWE. Competing. Everybody is. Whether they're working together. Is there a still checklist? A, there's is no the checklist. WWE I'm not, only I'm not saying six foot five? So that's what no, I mean no, no. for. I'm not saying there's I mean a checklist, sport. but I mean that's what I mean for sport. When you compete in sport, you're trying to be better than that other team. You're trying to get as many scores as possible. When not you're necessarily. On, when you're on when you're in gymnasts, uh, you're trying to get a grade. You're trying to get nines or tens to be the best to get a gold medal. There's no gold medals in wrestling. And then also saying competing for a spot. So necessarily, I guess me, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing there though, is yeah. that. For some people, like, I don't think every athlete thinks they're going to become an MVP or win a championship. I don't think everybody in the NBA, NFL, or any sport league that you look at thinks that they're going to win every championship. A lot of them might have the same mindset that you have with wrestling. They're happy to be there. They want to make the sport better. They're glad that they have the ability to be involved with it, and they love that. But you can't deny the competitive aspect of so many people involved in those sports as well as wrestling. It's the same competitive mindset that they want to win those championships. They want to become the best of the best. They want to be in the, the top companies and sign to the best contracts. And so I think I for that, that reason, I, that adds a, yeah. a sport aspect to it. But then I see that that's not the right mindset. When you are in the NBA, when you are in the NFL, when you're playing for your local high school team, you're trying to be the best in your area. You're trying to be the best that you can get on that sports team. Correct. Mm -hmm. In wrestling, when you have the mentality of, oh, he, you can want something that someone else has. You could want to be on all these shows, but you're not competing with someone of like, I'm forgetting the gymnast or not the gymnast, the ice skater's name right now, uh, Tanya Harding. If I say Gabriel Frezza, one of my good friends, another guy in the area that's really good. If I just attack him in a parking lot and break his knee, that doesn't mean I'm going to take his spot. There's not a number one, number two, number three. There's not a grand total list. But in sports, there is an MVP. You are trying to beat the other team. In your own team, you could not want to be the best. But I love the Last Dance documentary. I, I don't watch sports games, but I love the stories. I love the UFC countdown videos. The fights, I could give or take. Where it's when you have that mentality of, oh, well, I want this, I want this. It's, yeah, you want this. But in sports, you go to a compound. If you're in the foot, if you're in football and you're trying to get signed, you go to the compound. You're trying to jump the highest. You're trying to lift the heaviest. You're trying to run the fastest. In wrestling, you're competing with yourself, and it's literally, okay, well, I want this. What do I have to do? You have to go. Of to course, at an independent level. But what do you do when you get to the performance center, for example? You go through a combine. You go through those different right. So but I think also, there's still a certain thing to be said that that wrestling has a sport aspect to it. Whether oh, it's a complete I, I sport, sure, but like, I, I, for sure. 
Yeah. But I say it is more athletic to where if you do go to the performance center, though, once again, it comes down to me for a checklist. You don't have to be. They're not only signing Division One athletes. They're also signing mm -hmm. guys like Johnny Gargano that have been hustling on the indies for 15 years. And it's that passion where it's in sports. You're not going to pick this kid from this low league football uh, program just because they want it. Because you could say you want it all you want. But if you're not out there hustling, if you're not training, if you're not making the connections, if you're not thinking deeper besides just, oh, well, if I have a good match, it's like, yeah, you can have a good match. But are you a good person? Are you talking to everyone? Are you only are you only talking to people that you think are going to benefit you? Where it's in a real sports thing, you're trying to win. There's yeah. no winning in wrestling. I Whereas think a way I to can, look at it, yeah. sorry, sorry to cut you off, a way no to look at it is uh, look at a baseball player, for example. I mean, you could hit 400 one season. Um, but toward the end of that season, if you're not hitting 400, you may not be signed the next year. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your personality is. It doesn't matter that you do backflips when you get a home run. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. It just matters that you're getting numbers. And yeah. if you don't get the numbers, you don't progress. You don't get the big contracts. In wrestling, it's all about personality and your creativity and what you bring to the table, not just well, I'll disagree. I wouldn't say it's all about personality because there has to be a certain athletic aspect. There has to be a of certain course. skill level that you need to have as well, right? Because Ricochet I've got all the personality in the ring, but I'm nowhere near a Johnny Gargano. You right. know what I mean? I am eons away from a Johnny Gargano. So that's, that's um, how I would break it down then. Of If there's two Venn diagrams where art is all in how, like, photography it's all you can't really take a good photo and say i saw this majestic bird and then the photo is just blurry and it looks yeah. like you took a photo of bigfoot and then in the other category it's tom brady in the nfl of all of this resume pro wrestling's in the middle it's athletic but it's not sports for the fact that sports has a winner and a loser where in wrestling there is there's a winner and a loser for the story but if you look at an actor, just because an actor plays a baby face, sorry, a good guy all the time, doesn't mean they're a good guy in person. And just because they're a villain, because they act really good as a villain, they're not really good. Where it's some of the best athletes are not the best people, but they're real talented. So people think they're good. And in wrestling, it's that thing of you need to balance it out. You need to be creative. And you don't have to personally be creative. If you're in, say, the WWE, you have writers that will say, I think this is good for your character. And just because someone says this is good for your character doesn't mean it's a good idea. <laughs> and that's where WWE is the number one wrestling thing in the world. It's the number one wrestling league. And the fact that who they hire and who they fire is not based on statistics. It's based off of one dude at the end of the day giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That's where in sports, that doesn't matter. If you're a good athlete, but you're a bit of a dick to the other guys, Michael Jordan literally made up reasons why he hated people. It's like, this is a dude that took the last scoop of my favorite ice cream at Baskin Robbins. And he'll talk that, <laughs> he'll talk that crap on the court. And the other dude would be like, yo, MJ said I took his last ice cream scoop, but I'm, I'm right. But, but then to still counter your point, and I'm not going to, I don't want to take too much time yeah. away from like the rest of this show here, but in, in closing, and I think we should uh, go into this more in either a talk as Brendo sure. or a Knights of the squared circle episode. I agree with a lot, but I disagree in the sense that at the end of the day, Michael Jordan, sure, he could have been, you know, this bully, but there's no shortage of bullies in the mainstream wrestling world. There's no shortage of people that have, you know, that to this day are still cocky and brazen. Look at Brock Lesnar, for example. People. Right, Brock there's a lot a person, of person though isn't a POS. I agree, but neither is Michael Jordan. I wouldn't think Michael Jordan's a POS, but Brock Lesnar has certainly had his incidents backstage. He's certainly had his moments of being cocky and being so Michael Jordan esque, so to speak. This will come back to the final question, but I do think that the the people, especially in wrestling, which is where you want to specifically name them, the people in wrestling that are cocky, arrogant, and self centered only surround themselves with people that will help them until it's someone that might take their spot as opposed to I'd rather hang out with people that are way less talented than me so that I could help them along the way, guide them, give them a heads up, but then also surrounded by people that are so much more talented than me so I can learn. And I'm constantly in this middle ground of not being the best because I'll find someone way better than me and ask for their help to guide me. Whereas some of the people, especially on a local level that are very arrogant and cocky and about them, they don't, once someone surpasses them, they see them as competition. As opposed to, for me, I don't see this guy versus me. I see 
well, are the fans getting a good show? Are the fans supporting good people? Are the fans supporting people that aren't doing inappropriate things behind the scenes to hold people back? Actually, that's something I wanted to get into, but Aurora, it looks like you have something you want to say. I was actually going to ask about that because we haven't talked about it. And you have been talking to me at work, um, as you know, we've explained, uh, about this particular situation that's going on behind the scenes. But I don't, know, I don't know anything about it except for that there's this controversy going on currently. Um, Basically, so, don't uh, date in wrestling. It's, it's an easy thing to do. <laughs> don't date in wrestling? Or don't date other wrestlers' wives? Well, if you're not dating people in wrestling, you're not going to talk to other wrestlers' wives. But so that, I don't, because I've talked a lot about this recently. Well, before, especially. before we go into it, sorry. I, yes. Before we go into it, um, let me just preface this with something. Um, there's a big movement going on in the pro wrestling industry right now for accountability of one's actions outside of the ring. I think that's where we're getting into. Mm -hmm. um, in the in wrestling, I mean, you have people, guys rubbing up on guys and girls rubbing up on girls and guys rubbing up on girls and, you know, intergender matches and all kinds of stuff where it could be uh, a very sexually inappropriate <laughs> industry, right? It really could be. Yeah. Um, I mean, you look at two dudes in, in their underwear wrestling and you're rubbing up on each other and you got their butt in your face and stuff happens. Um <laughs> I can't not laugh. This is literally the most honest depiction of wrestling. Like wrestlers do say, "Oh, we pretend to fight in our underwear." So like this is how we describe it to normal people. And just hearing it broken down this way, it's just like it's funny for the fact that it's true. It's true. But I mean, at the same yep. time, you got to suspend disbelief in wrestling. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of uh, the show of it has it all making sense. So that's fine. But uh, behind the scenes there's a whole big situation going on. There's the Me Too movement with women being taken advantage of and um, you know people not getting opportunities the way they should. That's not what this show is about. Mm -hmm. This show isn't about bringing up names or talking about specific um, things that are wrong with the world. They're talking about, uh, we're supposed to be talking about things to make it better. Yeah. So do you think that throughout all the BS and without all the um, you know people cheating and, and this and that, the crappy there, situations. The crappy situations. Is there a way to actually fix the problem? Is there something that you can think of that would actually make the industry uh, a better place, uh, to give more respect, a little bit more encouragement? Is there something that needs to be removed from the equation to make the encouragement and the respect grow more in that environment? So, well, terrible people need to be removed. Sorry, before, sorry to cut you off, but that's, that's the first one. <laughs> So, uh, that's absolutely true. I mean, obviously, you want to get rid of the people that are obviously making problem, but how do you know it until it's too late, right? And then what do we yeah. do when you do know it? Are these people never to, to perform again? Like, what, what's the situation? How do you fix this problem? So, so you mentioned in wrestling, it's more accountability, where it's not just wrestling. It's society. It's entertainment mm -hmm. in general. And I, I was talking about this with someone in the last week and a bit or something, and I go... The reason why in all entertainment, not just wrestling, uh, like the Me Too movement became a thing in 2016, around the same time Black Lives Matter, it's becoming more of a socially conscious society. And it's literally 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, you could never be a star or making money or an impact if someone didn't give you the go ahead. It's very much you need to audition for this role and then you go in front of the producers and then you go in front of the director and then you compete with this other person where even in acting, there's competing. You're trying to get this role over someone else. Oh, but like man. for myself, Holden Albright's booked on a show. If I'm not booked on a show, they don't go, who's the next dude that's over 250 pounds that wears an animal mask? They just go, oh, he's not available. Who do I want to wrestle? It could be, could be literally there's... A lot of wrestlers now that are under five foot five and 130 pounds that could be the replacement for me because of the quality in it not so much the cookie cutter mold and i think with everything we even talked about podcasting earlier the barrier of entry being like 15 dollars a month for uh upload service where it's now to be successful isn't a three million dollar movie three times a year you could do content you could do podcasts you could do youtube and people think oh People make money off of this, so I'm going to do this versus, and Twitch is a big thing recently, versus not looking, how do they make money? Oh, they make money through merch. They make money through live events. They make money through partnerships. They make money through Patreons. There's crumbs make crumb cakes. When you're filling up all these buckets, that's how you make a full income of 
if so personally my goal has always been 35 and a half thousand a year and that's my like financial goal and i do think you need specific numbers for some goals because i read an article once saying the poverty line for either a single male or a family was 35 and a half a year thousand a year i was like okay well i guess that's what i need to make to survive and be at the poverty line and you could do that in in fields now because you're immediate with your audience your audience doesn't need to buy your dvd at Best Buy. The audience can buy a DVD directly from you that you made on your computer. They can buy a t-shirt from you at the merch table. And when society and the fans, and that's why I call fans fans, I call them investors because they're helping me pay my bills. They're not just in wrestling because they want to bring up carny stuff. They call marks. And I came from a history of magic. I love scams and cons. So I understand the actual definition of a mark. And a mark isn't someone you're entertaining because you want them to have a fun show or you're doing something you loved as a child. A mark is someone that has money you want in their wallet and you don't care what you have to do to pickpocket them, to just steal it from them, to make them think they broke your gift so they're giving you money for it. Where it's, if you start looking at fans as investors and people to come out to support you, you have a deeper bond with them and you see them as people, not just money in a wallet that you can take. So it leads to this, well, if the consumer is one removed from you or one degree, you need to be more accountable. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the world, and this is where I go, the one in a million, the one in a hundred, the one in a thousand, it's a lot of people, and we can do it now, we can just screenshot stuff on our phone. The amount of people that screenshot stuff We'll talk a whole lot of crap about it in a personal Facebook group of like, screw this guy, screw this guy, screw this guy. And then the next weekend they see them, they shake their hand because they've just been doing it five, 10 years longer than them. It's why aren't you the same way behind the scenes as you are in front of the scenes? Why any criticism I would have for anyone specifically, I would tell them to their face also. I might say it behind their back, but that's just because they're not in the room. But if I'm asked in person, I'm talking to them, I'll bring it up then. And I've done that personally. But then it becomes there are certain people in the local wrestling scene that have been secret. It's been an open secret where people are now, oh, that dude's just crappy or that dude is just that way as opposed to. No, that's that's not an answer for why is he being this way or why. And then especially for stuff that was more recent about adultery and involving families, if you look at the surface level and we're all old enough. And I think that's the thing of like, once you reach the age of 20, you've seen some sketchy situations. You've watched an episode of cops where not everyone that has murdered someone is guilty because what if literally they're being stabbed and then they stab the person stabbing them. It's way different than someone creeping up out of a bush and murdering someone from behind. So that's where you have to kind of take that in. And then when you only see the tip of the iceberg, and I keep using icebergs as my metaphor of choice recently, because there's 168 hours in a week. There's no way you know what everyone's doing in all the time. And you would hope they're not harming people, but there are times they're harming people. And it literally leads to you putting a person on a pedestal and then you don't want to believe it's true, but then people that are more inside the bubble and they talk to more people and they know that, oh, there's multiple victims, but because they either don't see themselves as worthy enough as this person, they're not gonna speak up. And that's been the big thing in wrestling, it's called speaking up. It's not saying cancel or accountability, it's literally called speaking up, where if all these victims only talk to two people each, and those people don't talk to each other. It just becomes a one-off situation of everyone makes a mistake. It's like, okay, but when there's 13 years of a history here, you you got outed for the mm -hmm. right reasons. Yeah. Yeah, and that's I think that's the key is communication, speak up, tell people things are going on, and uh, eventually people are going to start listening and reacting and doing things about it. Promoters aren't going to start hiring the people that are being talked about. Um and hopefully that whole side of things would just kind of stop happening. But I mean, humans are humans, right? Mm -hmm. There's always going to be there's always going to be issues, I guess. One hundred percent. Aurora, Mark, anything you want to ask, Ryan? My question, I think, at this point, uh, 
How okay. have you been handling this pandemic? Because I've been talking to you, it's been a little while, but the last time we chatted was about halfway through this pandemic. So now it's a full year. It's been a full year of sitting at home, not being able to wrestle. I know you actually ran a Christmas show, which was super awesome. I got to be a part of that. How are you handling the pandemic right now, man, a year into it? All my Facebook sasses right now are like, I'm going to Vancouver next month. I'm going to California. I'm doing this on the West Coast. Oh, wow. Barry Wrestling just had a banger of a show last night from the opening match of Gabriel Fuerza to the closing match with Wheeler. Literally, because that's the Facebook status I saw this morning. And oh, literally, man. it says, 2020 is going to be fire emoji. I was wrong. 2020 was a <laughs> garbage <laughs> fire emoji. <laughs> and And literally, it's the... Uh, without distractions, and everyone has distractions in their own way. There's positive and negative distractions. If you're using time to talk crap about someone or you're focusing on all the bad in the world, and this comes up in the challenge later on, of you're going to see only crap because that's all you're interacting with and seeing. Whereas I made a joke to someone two days ago. Wow, there's been no wrestling in a year fully. And I think there's been more drama than ever. And I'm like, yeah. how? <laughs> and literally, it's just because no one has anything else to do. Everyone's going stir crazy. And someone once told me it's easy to be nice. And that is a bold face lie. It is so much easier to be mean and not nice for the fact that almost every great joke, it's kind of rude. And it's kind of assaulting somebody. Where it's being nice, it's it's hard to have those encouraging moments all the time of like, someone's going to interact with bad news more than they're going to interact with good news. And that's just how people are in general. So I've, I've dealt with the pandemic all right, but that's, I've still had my job. I've gotten the benefit of creating and because even you mentioned it way earlier before we were recording about expressing uh, the creativeness, which is I'm always pushing for of. I think also like if your your hobby is working out or playing soccer on weekends, that might also work. But for me, I do think my brain needs to be stimulated and okay, well, I can create this, I can do this. And yeah, I I was gonna run a wrestling show last year. It was supposed to be November twenty second, and the pandemic happened. And I was already having like borderline doubts of being able to run the show and I was talking to other people, but like no matter what, I was going to run a show. I, I spent money to book people. Like, it was already money spent. And then the pandemic hit. And I could pick one of two things. One, go, man, I've already lost $1,200. Or I could go, that money's lost, whatever. Just move on. And it wasn't until my buddy did something that it motivated me. Oh, wait, I think I could do something. And talking about fans as investors, I didn't want to create something to just give people. I wanted to create something that everyone could be a part of. And that's what led to fans, wrestling promotions, wrestlers. And it was our way. We we did basically a holiday wrestling special. And it was part wrestling show with no crowd on a closed set under COVID uh, regulations. And then we also had fans come in. And then we, we did basically a, a homage to uh, what's it called? Home Alone. And there's all these things that we did. And it's my way of going, the world is like this. There's not a new normal yet. How do I, and that's the poster for it right there because uh, Ryan was a backer for it. And that was the thing of, I, I had people be a part of it, but I also was able to give them perks and such, which is something that when you only look at your own art form of how to do things, you're not even thinking in the box at that point. You're thinking in like a corner of a box where you do need to look at other places for inspiration of like, when I said crumbs make crumb cakes, how do YouTubers, podcasters, Twitch streamers, how do they make money? How do Instagram influencers make money? And it's like, oh, well, I'm basically making an independent film. How do they do it? Oh, I went to Indiegogo. I did all this. I did side deals off of Indiegogo also. But it led to everyone being happy with it. I, I haven't heard anything bad. But then also in wrestling, actually, I did hear one thing bad, but they're also very two-faced. Where in wrestling, if someone's not a part of something, they want it to fail. As opposed to, oh, I hope that's successful. So this gets more successful. And that's where I... I won't deny that there's c competition in wrestling. I think it should be with yourself, though, to be better. Because if you can blame someone else for you not working harder, 
it's lazy, where it's supposed to, you do need to look inside yourself. But I'm a big believer of, if you look past yourself at a greater purpose, a rising tide lifts all boats. It's not just going to be my boat. And then also, if the if a storm comes in, it's not just my boat that's going to be screwed up. I look five feet to my left. There's a boat over there. We need to come together to make sure we all survive. And that's the mindset that I go, that's toxic. That's just, that's what prevents growth. And in life, like, for instance, with people that are over the age of 40, they think, oh, I couldn't do wrestling. It's like, okay, you can't do wrestling, but you can do stand-up comedy. You can do podcasting. You can have a hobby that isn't as physical because your body has wear and tear. When wrestlers go, I I can't walk straight in my 40s because I was a wrestler for 20 years. And then there was one interview I saw, and I can't I can't name who it is because I forgot. But they mentioned, oh, how long have you been wrestling for? It's like, oh, 10 years. Oh, how often do you wrestle? Oh, I wrestle once a month. And this veteran just said, oh, so you've been wrestling for two years. And this person just went, uh, uh. It's like, yeah, because there's a difference between wrestling once a month versus five times a week. And that... Right, yeah. Where it's, I can look and go, if you work in an office and you're constantly in an office chair, that's going to screw up your back. If you're working in a factory, that's going to screw up your body in ways. If you're laying brick, that's going to screw up your knees. I don't go, wrestling is this tough thing on your body. It is tough. That goes without saying. But everything in life has wear and tear also. Like my dad drives tow trucks and he has a bad pinched nerve in his hip that one day, like 12 or 13 years ago now, he literally had to lay down on the side of a highway because he couldn't walk because that pinched nerve was so bad. And then when people don't look into other people and that, that's where what leads to this superiority complex and them having to see themselves as better than other people instead of, am I paying my bills? Okay. Am I breathing? Am I able to get out of bed in the morning? There's a lot of things to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at what you don't have versus what you do have, there's a lot we don't have. But do we need any of it also at the same time? Well, that's the thing, right? And that's what this whole show is about, is what will make you happy? What is your end game of happiness? What creativity brings to the table is so much more than just, um, you know, getting a paycheck and doing all those things. So um, I can't thank you enough for the time you spent with us tonight. I mean, there's a few more things I want to talk about, of course. Um, I still want to talk to you about the conversation you had with Puff's mom, because um, the the conversation about mental health is something that is real to all of us on the panel here. I know Aurora is a big part of the Henry's Mental Health Foundation, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that toward the end of the conversation. So I'm not going to let you off the hook about that conversation with Puff's mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, before we do that, family, I want to know how important is family to you in your wrestling career or your creative career? Have they endorsed it? Have they supported it? Like, um, I know you love your Nona. You talk about her all the time. How, how big of an influence is she and, and the rest of your family on your, on your creative expression? Well, so it's actually my friend Jody Threat's birthday today. Oh, that's and, right. And she is a – she's basically like a social worker. And, and we became close friends like four or five years ago. And on a lot of car rides, you just talk. And she made me realize how neglected I was growing up. Oh, man. And uh, <clears throat> when you're diagnosed with something like that, you're like, wait a minute, what? And then you see all the proof of it and you realize that you just – because I'll bring up perspective and stuff. I can look back in my life and go, wow, there's a lot of things that if I dwelled on those situations, I wouldn't be the man I am today. And literally that could be from overeating myself and be one of the people that are like on my 700 pound life to just not being alive today. And that's because I never dwelled on it. And it's a good and a bad where it's when I was in the situation, I'm like, well, at least I'm not a starving child in Africa. At least I have a house. At least I was grateful accidentally. I wasn't purposely, I didn't have a five minute journal at that point saying, I'm grateful for this. I appreciate this. Where it's just in my mind of going, you can be Peter Griffin stumbling and holding his knee and just going, ah, my knee or very much like me, where it's no matter how big the fall was, no matter how much damage other people did to me, I can go, well, at least I didn't fall off the cliff. At least I didn't fall that way. At least I fell on this side and I just never dwelled on it. And that led to a life of just not reflecting enough. And then when the the cracks were opened in that Pandora's box from Jody telling me I'm neglected, I had all these experiences. I'm like, oh, that led to this. And 
I've wanted to go to therapy. I've legitimately never carved out time for it. And it's something that me and Ryan even mentioned the last time we actually properly sat down and chatted where he offhandedly said, I don't have time. And I went, you don't make time for it. And he said, yeah. And it's, that's how you know your priorities of, I know Brian is in a happily committed relationship. I know Ryan is recently happily married <clears throat> where it's, for myself, I've never had that relationship and I needed to find, I call it social currency of, I needed to find my value in other people's attention. And it was telling jokes. It was doing magic tricks. It was now becoming a good wrestler to where now I'm like, wait, that's not what counts. All that counts is, am I happy? And am I doing as little harm to anyone else to myself to make me happy? And literally once like that comes into play, it goes, okay, so I start thinking a little deeper as opposed to just at the surface level. I only started buying action figures like the last four or five years. And it was literally, it's, I see them as little artwork. I, I remember I literally have artwork of wrestlers on the wall there of like personal drawings from artists. And it's my way of looking and going, what do I love? As opposed to, it's the same reason why people have multiple photos of their family all over their house. These are your, they're literally called your loved ones. Where it's for my family, I didn't realize how unloved I was. And that's what motivated me to find this. And then I I thank wrestling so much. And that's why I fight so hard for it. And I want it to be a good place for other people. Where it's I found my own value in myself through wrestling. Because I found people that, yeah, some of them only valued me because I was a good wrestler. But then the friendships I developed from that and then going, if wrestling, if I never get booked on a wrestling show again, my legacy won't be... Well, he had these bangers of a match. It will also be he raised people up. He helped other people. And I think that's a greater purpose instead of championships or accomplishments. It's the impact you left on people. People, once again, like I mentioned earlier, they don't remember what happened. They remembered how they felt. And my nun is the one person that I can say I unconditionally love in my family. And I've had... Right before the pandemic started, I think it was something about being at the beginning of a new decade. I was thinking 10 years down the line. I'm like... What am I doing in 2030? And there was times I turned 28 a few months ago. There was times I said, I won't be alive past 30 or past 35. And I wasn't living recklessly. I wasn't doing a bunch of drugs. I wasn't doing self-harm uh, activities. And it led to me just going, oh, I don't want to be alive that long because I'm miserable and it's depression. But I didn't know it was depression at the time. And now I'm looking, well, 10 years. I'm like, wow, that's a very optimistic perspective to have. And then I thought about my family. My my parents are like 55, 56 right now. I'm like, okay, well, when they're 65, 66, where is my career taking me? Where's my sister's career taking her? And I'm like, even though I have a tumultuous, to say it lightly, relationship with my parents, I know that at the end of the day, I'm probably going to be sending a check every month so that they can pay their bills. Even if I never talk to them again, I know that I, in my heart, and it's it's almost like Stockholm Syndrome. It's kind of like yeah. whatever, but that's where when people mention family, they think it has to be blood, where family is the people that care about you, even if it does more harm to them to lift you out of that. And like me and Ryan are a lot closer for the fact that I know more of his personal experiences. And there's times where in our lives, either by our own decisions or other situations outside of us, we're put in bad spaces where we do need to put a hand out. And I have a draft tweet that I haven't sent yet, but I randomly thought about it last week where I'm like, everyone will tell people to get help, but no one wants to be the person to help that person. They just tell them, oh, go get help, go find it, go whatever, where it's like, well, we, I'm not a licensed therapist or anything, but if someone is pent up and they're frustrated and they need an ear to listen to them, I'll be that ear. I'll also tell them when they're an idiot and it's their fault that they're in that reason where it's a lot of people won't tell them it's their fault. They'll try to blame other people where you do have to find it in you. What can you change of that situation? And it hurts. Like I'm a very positive person, but the amount of heartbreak I've suffered and not from like relationships. Well, yeah, everything's a relationship, friendships, uh, romantic families. It's all relationships. But when you put your heart out there so many times and you believe the best in people, Guess what? Not everyone's the best. I was I was just gonna ask, do you think because of these that you almost lost faith in people? Because that's I do hear that a lot where when you say something like, you know, a lot of people will say go get help, but they don't want to be the ones to give that help. 
I almost don't think that's true. I think a lot of those people that will post those statements say, because I'm definitely one of them. I and I'm the first one to say in those statements, you know, if you're somebody who's struggling with addiction, I said it actually on our very first episode. If you're somebody with who's struggling, go reach out, reach out to me, reach out to those that have struggled. I think there's something to be said for those people that are saying go get help. They're there saying reach out to me. So whether they say with, it directly with, or not, I feel a lot of those people are indirectly saying reach out to myself. So people like you that would post reach out to someone if you need someone on me i mean specifically uh, like i can bring up literally a thing that happened a week and a half ago where it's once again it's another argument with my family and i tell them they're in the hole they're in because of themselves they they will say oh they want the best for whatever but your intentions need to match your actions like for me the thing with my family that is always like this irritated me was literally it's almost like hoarders and this is where i'll be like a little more open it's a mixture of like hoarding versus just being lazy and not cleaning and it's led to me that if i go to a friend's house and they're like oh i'm so sorry it's a mess or anything if i can see the floor if there's not animal feces stuff on the floor or anything like that that's not then that means it's not filthy it's a little cluttered and maybe you didn't vacuum today but you'll will eventually where it's with my family in particular, I've told them, hey, clean the house, do this, show with your actions. But then they'll tell me, go see a therapist, where the therapist will then tell me, you feel the way you feel about your lack of value because people treated you like you didn't have worth. And I now found people that they didn't care about what I could do for them. They just cared about hanging out with me to watch a movie or cared about me enough to, we'll go on a uh, car rides between shows. And that leads to, yeah, people can lose faith in humanity all you want, but it's almost like there's there's plenty of fish in the sea of just if your one relationship goes wrong, you don't just write off, I'll never find love. You could, but that's because it's hard. It, uh, that's the easy way to wrote. It's That's what's easy. That's what leads to the one in a hundred of, well, 99 people will be like, hu people are the worst. Because I literally put up a status this way uh, today that literally said, that's why people will be like, people are worse, are horrible. No, people aren't horrible. Some specific people are, and you have to realize what personality traits you don't like in people. If you don't like people being dishonest or constantly talking bad about other people behind their back, you need to recognize those character traits and take it out as opposed to saying everyone in the world is like that. Because out of seven and a half billion people in the world, not everyone's that way. And that's what makes the world so great for the fact that we don't all have the same experiences where there's not a, there's no reason that I was born without cancer. And then a baby born five minutes later than me was born with no limbs. Like there's not a, well, I deserve this for this. Like, no, it's luck. It's right, just right. So, happens. but I guess going back to the initial question though, right? Because I'm hearing you say, I'm hearing you play both sides of that. I'm hearing you on one side say there's a lot of people that will ask, you know, say, go get help, but you don't have that faith in them you know, just being selfish and saying, go get help, but I'm not that one. But on the other side, you're saying there's billions of people out there and not everybody's terrible. So how do you personally feel when you look at the world? Are you approaching everybody with a positive mindset or are you approaching most people being like, I don't, you're probably a bad person, but until I get to know you, you know, earn my trust, earn my respect. What, how do you approach people? I, I forget what the word is for it, but it, it's like hoping for the best, but yeah, that's it. It's hoping for the best, but expecting, expecting the, the worst. worst. And it's okay. literally the, cause Ryan, once again, like it wasn't an attack on you because how many people do you know say, oh man, I wish oh, I could I do, do it. I didn't do it as an attack on me. Oh, no, no. I, I just. <laughs> so that's what I mean by saying both sides of the fence. I'm saying yeah. you specifically, you are that one in a hundred. You are that one in a thousand. You might not be that one in a million, but you're on your way there. You're trying to figure it out where it's the amount of people that will say, cause, and I'm singling out Ryan. Cause like we've had these conversations before and I could use it as evidence of the amount of people that tell me, Oh man, I wish I could be a wrestler. It's like, well, why can't you be? Well, uh, I'm out of shape. Okay. Then work out and then you can become a wrestler. Like there's a pathway to do that. And with Ryan, it's you, you being on coyote whoo, radio, it's people like, Man, I wish I was on the radio. It's like, you do realize there is a way to do this and you just have to figure out your hustle and your grind to get there where it's 99 people wish they were doing it. 
that one person's doing it and then they're comparing themselves to that one in a thousand that's a little more successful than them and you're either bitter at them and saying i wish i had that and then you're that one you're that 999 out of a thousand or you're that one going how did they get there okay they got there doing this 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 and then they move on to that and then it's how do i become one in ten thousand it's all those small steps if that makes sense of yep. lit literally bell let's talk day the intention is great for that but also the things that you constantly hear about that is uh what's it called how many people were bell employees and they had mental health issues and the company fired them where as opposed to if it was just a national day of hey be open about mental health and that's where also people struggling in silence it comes back to victims not knowing about each other of you need to be open and it's people are afraid to get their heart broken of it's hard work to trust everyone but also if people haven't given you a reason to not trust them it's like okay but you have to be open to hearing be prepared because there's a track record of this and until it affects you immediately you're like okay i kind of get it. and then when it affects you you're like how did i deal with the situation and am i one of the people that just let it happen to the next person and go oh well they'll learn or do you give a heads up to that person by going hey this is what's happened before just a heads up and that's where it is the 99 people will post that status of go i'll be that ear if you listen to but then also there's a quote i saw and it affected and i share a lot of quotes i see and i i don't want to be this hippie guy i'm non-religious but then at the same time you have to kind of believe if you say it out loud and the universe will kind of hear you, it'll come back to you tenfold, hopefully, and you get out what you put in. And literally, it's some people will find time for you. Other people will make time for you. And it's literally if someone's there and they just message you, hey, dude, how's it going? And you just see that message or just, oh, this is my buddy, James. I'll get back to him when I can. But you don't realize on the other end of it, James is literally tying a noose and he just needs one person to tell him oh hey what's up and it's just that quick message because not every cry for help is literally a long ass post or a potential suicide note it's literally just hey how's it going and then just make that little conversation with them as opposed especially wrestling so i'll say this for the wrestler mentality a lot of wrestlers look at their fans as a burden like oh this person's facebook messaging me well you added them on facebook of course they're going to message you uh -oh. uh, he just uh ryan just had to take off for a second he'll be right back okay cool uh and that's where it's that you have to be prepared for heartbreak and it hurts it sucks especially if it's someone real dear and near to your heart but it'll make you a better person it's that whole it's scars make a better story that once you get callous you can do that and callous is preparing for that heartbreak as opposed to some people just go oh well that's the whole world. No, there's seven and a half billion people. Everyone in your circle, in the five people you know, the 10 people, 100, they might all be horrible people, but then get yourself out of that scenario then, if yeah. that makes sense. Something that, that I absolute hope... sense. Sorry, Mark, did you want to say something else? No, I was just thinking um, you had said something er earlier about, you know, uh, having to reach out. And uh, sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is to actually admit that you need help. And, um, and I think, um, sounding, you know, listening to what you're saying about your childhood and, and that, and, and, um, sometimes it's just, you have to step back and say, you know what, I need someone to help me. And, um, to your point, not every person that says, Hey, I'm here for you will be there for you. Um, but if you've got a big enough network of people, somebody will make that time yeah. for you. And they'll they'll take your hand and they'll and they'll help you out with that. So that's uh, that's a great thing about society, um, and about that seven and a half billion people. Um, you know, maybe seven billion of them are the ones that would take your hand if you if you reached out, um, and that half a billion are are possibly have their own struggle themselves yeah. and are not. not it's being vulnerable. It. Yeah. People don't want to be vulnerable. They want to look like superstars or rock stars, and that's yeah. the unfortunate part. And it's it. I say it sucks for the heartbreak element of like friendships or whatever, but then it sucks if you try to be vulnerable and then people make a joke of it or like, oh, whatever, where it's, yo, you have to respect how hard work that is to be vulnerable also. And that's, that's what also leads to victims feeling less than of this person mistreated me, so I don't want anyone else. And then when they see this person's in a higher stature than they are, and it's all this less than where it's, 
if you don't see life like a competition, if you see it as it is collaboration, try to do as little harm to other people, find your own happiness that you can proceed there. And that's where you realize success isn't a financial number of a million dollars or the top of whatever field it's, well, what's your quality of life? Is that good? Are you happy? Cause no one ever talks about happy. They talk about all the money they have. And it's like, no, but are you happy? Are you in a loving relationship? And that's, People, for me, I don't take that for granted. I didn't have a relationship until the pandemic because I've constantly been distracted and I didn't want to deal with the Brendan Caulfield and love side. I wanted to be productive and show my worth in this. I thought that was a raccoon behind you for a second and I was very (laughs) impressed. Uh, But literally that's the thing of account in society now to be some sort of fame or notoriety. You have to be vulnerable. You have to show off and... It even comes down to OnlyFans is successful because someone's very vulnerable that they're showing literally no clothing on. They're like, this is world, this is me. And then they can make money off of that and stuff. So it's very much a, the world is very deep in a bucket. You just need to pull into it. It's a completely different time now too. Like obviously the pandemic has removed everybody from each other's life. I haven't seen my father since March last year. And, um, you know, it's just a really crazy time and it's definitely making you, making me reevaluate what's important. I've always had the philosophy that, you know, humans suck. Yeah. Every human has the potential of sucking really hard. Mm-hmm. And um, it's the really good people that don't. And those, those are the unfortunate things that sometimes you just don't take the time to learn who the people are. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always loved about pro wrestling was how, you know, you'd show up for an event and everybody would walk up to you and shake your hand and introduce themselves. And new wrestlers knew that they had to be respectful of everybody that they went into the room with. Um, I always felt that real respect when I'd walk into the room. I was like, hey, Brian, you know, walking up, shaking my hand, having a quick chat or something like that. Um, but it wasn't until later that I realized how depression has brought a lot of people into the wrestling world. Um, self-harm, as you mentioned, you, you were never into self-harm, but I've seen you take dives out of rings onto pebble stone ground. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, you know, you have to at least be okay with getting hurt, getting yeah. into that. And, and a lot of that has to do, I think, with how you're raised and how you're brought up and so on. Hey, Ryan's back. Um, I fell into a trap really hard of resenting family and upbringing and being dragged up instead of raised up. And there were a lot of situations that happened, I think, in all of our lives that we look back at and say, well, this formed me and this brought me to this place. And, you know, because this happened, I react this way. And um, I'm hearing a lot of that from your conversation. And it seems like you're in a really good place with it, which is excellent. Um, is how, how real is that for you, though? Like, are you in a good place for this or... Are you still trying to convince yourself that you're in this place? So uh, you mentioned a great, so when I was mentioning self-harm activities, I'm talking about like people that are Partying drinking. And- well, no, no, no. Cause that's the, the self-harm definition of it. I meant like people that are, they're getting inebriated and then they're getting behind the wheel of a car. They are jumping off of cliffs just to see they're doing jackass style stunts. And then when you look at the core of, why are you doing this? Because I'm not going to lie. There are times where I've been behind the wheel and I probably shouldn't have. And I've gotten lucky that nothing bad happened. And it's always every like drunk driving commercial. It's it's trying to say your actions have consequences that are past you. You could hit that family that is in a minivan and kill them. Where it's a lot of people don't think about that. They think about well, whatever, I'm worthless or I'm whatever. And then they do those activities and you have to realize there's less value. And I actually mentioned maybe a couple of years ago, I realized I'm like, I don't self-harm, but my wrestling is my way of self-harming. That's why I I didn't put too much trust in the fact of, oh, well, am I going to be able to walk without a cane when I'm 40? Okay, let me do this dumb stuff where now it's, there was a time in 2018, late 2017, where I could point it out and go, I did not value my own self being. And now I go, well, I created a style for myself and it's calculated risk of me going, what's the worst case scenario that happens here? And if the worst case scenario isn't death, 
it's like, well, I'm going to hope for the best. And if it doesn't go the best, I know that this is the worst thing that could happen. And that was my way of self-harm. And it wasn't until one of my friends, uh, what's it called? Um, Brad Myers, who's a referee, opened up a lot more that I realized that. And then in wrestling, I, I was taught by someone that, what's it called, that you're not the best you are right now of your potential you're on your way there but you should be better than you were yesterday and last week and i think that's how i see society and my own mental health of there are days and this is why i'm a lot of positive people think it's oh don't acknowledge or ignore every negativity that's not how the world works there's a yin and a yang and there's a little negative in that positive there's a little positive in that negative and that's how the world works and if you just ignore the negative because you think that's positive you're not going to be productive at the end of the day. And it's always try not to think of today, think of tomorrow, think of next year, think of down the road. Because if you are thinking of two years down the line, you're probably not going to kill yourself today. Right. Yeah. Valid. Totally valid. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, Aurora, I think you had something to say. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you've brought up some really great points, Brennan. Um, I, uh, I really did, uh, like the conversation that you had earlier, um, it was actually much earlier, um, about being a creative person and evaluating, um, evaluating yourself and not mm -hmm. comparing yourself to others. Yeah. Um, so like evaluate out, evaluating your personal growth. I think a lot of people who are creatives, they tend to get into this rut where they don't want to create or they don't want to uh, put out new things because they are comparing themselves to others, um, whether it's through social media or performances or whatever it may be. I've been guilty of that before in the past. I think we all guilty. have, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. I hung out with Peter McKinnon. So like I'm <laughs> continuously comparing myself to stuff like he would do and all these other amazing people I've worked with at Henry's. Uh, it's really hard to not do that. That's why I yeah. came up with my whole, I shoot for me, you know, like that was my saving grace in 2017 to pull myself away from that edge. Yeah. Sorry, Roy. Yeah, no, I, they're all great points. So I feel like, um, I hope this encourages people to do the same thing. Cause I know that there's a lot of great creators out there who, you know, don't put themselves out there and you really <laughs> should put yourself yeah. out there and uh, compare yourself only to your own growth. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that was one great point. Another thing um, that I found of personal value um, in a conversation that you're having earlier is um, that yourself, uh, putting yourself worth not in what you can do for others, uh, but, uh, you know, other things like yeah. either your own personal life, your own personal gains, um, not what you can do for others, but, um, you know, why do those others appreciate you not for <laughs> the things mm -hmm. that they you do for them? Um, for me, I had a bit of a personal journey last year where I thought, you know, my purpose of for certain things was to be um, there to help people always. Um, and I overexerted myself to, you know, no end um, to try to help everyone I could wherever I can. Uh -huh. And it was just too much. Um, so, you know, putting yourself worth in something other than like serving people and helping people um, and what can I do for them? Like you're more valuable than that. Uh -huh. Uh, so I think that was a really good point you brought up earlier too. So, yeah. Awesome. Burn, burnout is the best lesson because then that teaches yeah. you what led to me being burnt out. And that's how you learn. Do more of what you love and do less of what burns you out. Yeah. Yep. It's a well good point, said, yeah. For sure. Well said. All right. Well, this leads us to a couple questions that we have for you. First of all, um, what's your jam? What are you listening to right now? Well, literally, I have Spotify in the background right now, and I'm listening to Forever by Drake, Kanye West, Lil Wayne, and Eminem. That's literally Hey! Right. <laughs> I'm not mad at that. I'm right. not mad at that. <laughs> that's, that's literally playing right now. And, like, I am... I listen to everything. I'm more of, like, a top 40s or a top 100 guy. There's some artists I like, but there's... Uh, music isn't my jam of, like, oh, I'm gonna go down this rabbit hole where I have my artists, but I'll listen to anything and, like, as long as I like it and there's uh, recently I've come to like, I'll just hear a line in a song and literally 
Nelly's, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, crap, I'm forgetting the name of his song right now. Hot but... in here is the only one I could give you help with. <laughs> That's the only one I know from Nelly. <laughs> but So I forget what it's called, but there's a line in it that is... Uh, if hard work pays off, easy work is worthless. And that's why I go in that one of 99, one in a uh, thousand and stuff like that. It's because you do have to work hard. It's easy to write people off and to say, screw everybody. But it's hard to be vulnerable. It's hard to get your heart broken. But those are the, that's burnout. That's where pressure makes a diamond of like, that's where the hard work. If, if you want to lose weight, if you want to get in better shape, you have to eat better and go to the gym. It, those are what you have to do. But how many people are going to actually do it? We all know we have to do it if that's what we want. But then it's the consistency of going to the gym multiple days, not just once. And that's what hard work is. Hard work is physical labor. It's also mental labor and it's emotion. And that's hard work every day. When you wake up in the morning and you're able to breathe, it's another good day. You got to put the work in. Yep. Oh, well said. Well said. Absolutely. All song, right. And the, so and the song is Heart of a Champion. That was it. That was it. Literally, I I pieced it together. I, I started with Champion, and I looked at my phone, and I immediately just went, yeah. Heart of a Champion? Thank you so yeah. much, Mark. I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know it. I, I, I have to admit, I didn't know it. I Googled it. Yep. Um, but I'm going to listen to it after the podcast. So after we're done here, I'm going to listen to it. Nice. <laughs> and this is why we do What's Your Jam. Also, <laughs> one more question. Uh, tools of the trade. What, uh, what tools would you use – that improve your day-to-day -day creativity? Uh, my friends. I'll say that's number one. Brian, you're one of them. Ryan, you're one of them. That if, Especially me and Ryan, because our influences are literally the exact same moment of 2010 and Byte Radio, where <laughs> we're both writing into this podcast that probably only had like 100 listeners. And it's, it's basically- We both ripped off Byte Radio, which is the craziest yes. thing to me. We both held po or did podcasts in 2011, 2012. That was a complete ripoff of Byte Radio. <laughs> and, and our paths went in such different directions, but we were influenced by the same thing. And what's funny is both of us weren't legal age to drink, where it was a bunch of people our age now talking about their weekend <laughs> adventures that you can get that influence from anyone and i now go okay well i'm motivated by artists so brian every time you post a photo and i'm just like that is i don't give a crap about birds but that is a pretty bird <laughs> and, then, and then ryan will because me and him will talk about like hustle sides of specific things of i want to try this or i want to try this but then when he posts photos with his wife and I see how supportive she is of it where I'm like, Oh, Ari's great for that. And like, I see that and that motivates me that I might not have. And it's rude to say I'm in a relationship right now, but I'm fast. I'm rewinding to a year ago when I was single and I go somewhere down the line, I'll find my person. Even if every relationship before this has told me pick wrestling or me. And I picked wrestling every time somewhere down the line i will find my ari i will find my shelly i will find that person that motivates me yeah brian you're actually in the same category of every time you and shelly post photos where it's that of i get motivation not just from people in my own field i get it from other things and then that's what motivates me so i think my number one tool is surrounding myself with the right people that if i'm one of the wrestlers that i don't value anyone outside of wrestling brian you brought up things about respect how many people like when you're signing up the vip thing and I'm bored, I'm gonna go over and chat with you. And we're just gonna talk for like 20, 30 minutes. How many people just walk up to you and shake your hand just because they think that's what they have to do? Not realizing how great of a person you are or how great you can make them look. And that was advice that Mr. Perfect gave Stone Cold Steve Austin. He first gets to the WWF and he goes, Mr. Perfect is a well-respected wrestler at this time. And he goes, kid, I'm gonna introduce you to the people that are gonna make you look good. And he didn't bring them to the bosses. He didn't bring them to the top guys on the roster. He took them to Kevin Dunn, who's the director. He took them to the cameraman. And that's where you had to put that value in other people. Because also, the benefit of 7.5 billion people is I don't know everything. But I'm pretty sure I can message someone. Or I posted on my Facebook this weekend that I watched The Matrix for the first time. I did not finish watching it. But the oh, you, of, hang on, hang on, hang. We need to cut this short right now. Then you <laughs> need to go and finish watching The Matrix. That's what I'm gonna do today. That's what I'm gonna do. I was a little tired. It wasn't the best movie to fall asleep to, so I paused it and I was waiting for Sunday or today to watch it. Literally, is what I'm gonna watch after this. But the amount of people that just went, "How did you not see this movie?" And I joked, "I'm like, I've been busy," and people would be like, "For 18, 20 years." I'm like, "Well, the movie came out 22 years ago," and that's the thing of 
just because something is well known or it's in pop culture, that doesn't mean everyone has seen it, especially when it's like a rumor or something online. And it's like, did you see this Facebook post? Did you see this tweet? No, I was sleeping. No, I was in the washroom. No, it just got passed in it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's the thing of as long as you have other people that you can go to, that's the biggest tool. People are the biggest priority in tool. You just need to find your tribe and your community of who you can bounce those ideas. Me and Ryan at a certain point in this conversation seemed like we hated each other. We're having a, a debate. And that's the thing of people will get into arguments, but not a debate. An argument is I'm right. You're wrong. A debate is here are my facts. Here are your facts. And we meet in the middle for a mediation. And so yep. many people rather argue than debate because there's an art in debating. The only thing in an argument is possibly a restraining order and the police coming. <laughs> well, yeah, and just, just to clear something up real quick as well, because I'm sure you didn't, uh, you don't think that we had any sort of hatred in that conversation no. because I genuinely want to come on to your show or have you on my show to talk yeah. about that more because you are somebody that I won't argue with. You and I can disagree on topics and have a debate. We can go back yeah. and forth and disagree. And even if we come away disagreeing about something, yeah. We will see the other person's point, and that's the main thing. You need to be able to take a step back and listen to the other viewpoint. Mm -hmm. If you're not, then you're just closed-minded, and you're not gonna you're not gonna get anywhere. You're not going to yep. be able to accomplish anything that way. Well, that's 100%. the problem with the debate is you you have to be willing to admit you're wrong, <laughs> yeah, or at least concede the other person's point of view. But yep. the best yep. part for me is that I that was my question that caused that debate. So I was like, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I love Ryan so much. If there wasn't yeah. a pandemic going on, I would yeah. probably map out my Kitchener dates where Crossbody is. And I would just get there like two hours early so me and Ryan could meet up for a coffee or grab breakfast that day. This, I said that it seems like we disliked each other for the people listening on the podcast in the future of me and Ryan – he said we went way back, and then he said two years ago. And I was like, <laughs> we went that far back? But our two-year relationship is so strong. And I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing. I'm like, yeah, like we go way back. It's been two years. Oh, <laughs> oh, well, to be fair, yeah, I love this man as if I've known him for years. So <laughs> It's quality of time, not quantity of time. 100%. And that's just it. You nailed it. You nailed it, Brian. Yeah, that's the thing that you get when you build relate when you build experiences – uh, based on crazy things like wrestling, especially, right? Um, there's so many heightened emotions that go on in the world of wrestling. And when you can share those emotions with somebody, that creates a bond. And that's why wrestlers are such good friends with each other, too. In yeah, many 100%. Ways. Not all wrestlers are good friends with each other. But it comes in, there's a trust in wrestling of if I wrestle you, we're going to take care of ourselves because there's a chance that if you slip, you can drop me right on my head and break my neck. Whereas yep. in other, I think that's also where it comes in sports in my mind of you're not caring about who the other on the defensive end is. If you're on the offense, your goal is for that football, not to reach the other end point. Or so I've been told I'm not good at sports. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't like my sports predetermined. <laughs> I don't sport either. You're not alone here. <laughs> All right. Oh, by the way, if you want to check out another crazy movie, check out tank girl. Ooh, I've heard good things about it. It oh, is yeah. not Definitely something that people that say a lot of good I'll, things about, I'll but I love it. it. Shelly hates it, and I always tell everybody, you got to watch Tank Girl. <laughs> no, All right. All right, so um, we asked you to prepare something for us, Brendan. Yeah. We asked you to prepare a challenge. What we're trying to do is uh, challenge our viewers to you know think outside the box or to oh, find their own voice of expression or anything like that. Um, so I asked you if you would – come up with a challenge for our viewers and what have you come up with the next time you feel any emotion from joy to anger and sadness to just even just meh i want you to ask yourself why i want you to dig deeper inside yourself and this is why some people need to go to therapy because they won't ask themselves these questions once again when the world opens up i do want to go to therapy i literally had a uh things scheduled for the end of March last year and then this all happened and luckily I've never been at the breaking point I've asked myself why because there have been times during this pandemic because literally we we heard words in the past 12 months that we never heard outside of B-rated direct-to-DVD horror movies lockdown pandemic quarantine like these are words that weren't readily available now they're on the news every single day where it's like if you don't register that we do live in a world that is very scary and it's also 
it's not like there is one person out there killing people and we're on the hunt for this mass murderer. It's this thing that's just, you can't see it. So it's kind of like the boogeyman and you can't put your finger on it. And it's mysterious. It's asymptomatic. It's all the symptoms. It could kill you in two days. It could also be in your system and you not know that it is stressful. And you do need to acknowledge that the world is scary right now. And that's the thing. People don't want to admit they're scared. It's in that vulnerable stage. But there have been times during this pandemic that I've been sad. And sometimes it's literally, I go, okay, well, I have a moment and... I'll joke that I'm not human because I don't cry. I go, oh, this is the moment. I have the shortness of breath. My eyes are dry. This is where a human would, uh, liquid would come out of their eyes because I'll compare myself to a robot. But then I go, why am I sad? And if it's something that other people made me feel or if I felt for myself or also it's just, I'm sad because the world is unknown, but then I can register it. But then on the flip side of that, if I'm joyous and I'm happy, I'm like, why am I happy? Oh, I just had a bomb ass podcast with two of my friends and I made two new friends and I made two people that I didn't know before this, but now I know and I've had a conversation with them. Oh, I want to do more of that. And that's led to me recording a lot of podcasts and not posting all of them because my priority is just talking to people. But then you have to find on the flip side of that, what makes you angry? If you're surrounded by people that infuriate you, are you going to stay surrounded by those people or are you going to cut yourself off? And that's where that's a hard work of breaking up. People don't want to break up in a relationship, let alone friends, family. And I do not say I'm perfect. Far from it. There are weaknesses I see in my life that I think I would be further if I wasn't in the situation. But then that hard work comes in. I, I brought up my family. I do think my family is one of the things that's an anchor in my life preventing my growth. But I also know that I am connected to this anchor because I think that's what the societal norm is. Mm -hmm. And when you go against that, you realize that's how you can do stuff, more stuff that makes you happy and less stuff of what makes you sad or angry. Because if you just go, I'm angry or I'm sad at this moment, and you don't dig deeper into why you're that way, you're never going to know what it is. So I, my challenge to anyone, no matter what, it's figure out the why and ask yourself how you got here. And if it's something that you can change and you have control over, do it. I, I work with a lot of people because I work two to 10 AM pretty much at a shipping company that they will say, man, I hate this job. These it's like, okay, what do you hate about the job? These hours. Okay. Then find another job that has different hours. You're not stuck in this situation, but then also I'm in that job because I want to wrestle in Chicago on a Friday afternoon or a Friday night and not have to take a day off of work. That's why I'm there. Someone else might be there because they have three jobs to support their family. When you figure out the why, you now know why it's there. Instead of the, it's the whole, people are the worst. Why are people the worst? Well, they all lie. They don't all lie. Find the people, find your community. And that's the hard work. So ask yourself why for every emotion you have. If you're happy, sad, angry, melancholy, whatever, just ask yourself why. Dig deeper. That would be my biggest tool to give everyone. And that's something that you don't need to buy anything. You don't need to go to a therapist. And if you, because not everyone can afford therapy, not everyone can afford everything, but you can look at yourself and go dig deeper and ask those hard questions. But it's hard work. People don't want to do it because it's scary. Yeah, it's uh, funny you, you compared yourself to a robot. I was talking to Aurora. She and I both play Dungeons and Dragons. She plays it a little more regularly. I played it with my little brother and my nephew for a while over COVID when we first all went on lockdown. It was nice getting together with family and doing something. Uh, but the character I chose was an android because I thought it kind of connected most with my you know, detachment from being emotional about a lot of things. Um, I can sit through a lot of things, but then I hear a singer and they hit these notes and the tears just like go. So it's just, it, it's weird how you, you connect to certain things differently and uh, your dig deep in your emotion and ask yourself why. I think that's awesome. That's not expected. And I, I think it's great. That's awesome. Perfect. And, and I hope people actually take that challenge and, and do it with themselves. Um, okay. So that's pretty much our whole conversation today. Brendan, you were awesome, dude. I knew you would be. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks for having um, me on. Well, you're very welcome. And I do want to get back to that thing I wanted to talk about. 
that conversation. <laughs> I knew. I've been sitting um, here for like 20 minutes. Like, when is it coming back? It's coming back right now uh, because it goes back to mental health. Uh, Puff's mom, uh, one minute you're talking to Puff, who is this bigger than life personality, uh, having a completely different conversation. Then all of a sudden, Puff's mom sits down and she is a youth child counselor for mental health. Yeah, crazy. And all of a sudden, you flipped the gear in your head and you were thoughtful and you were listening. It wasn't funny joking puff time anymore. It was, this woman has something interesting to say. I want to find out more about it because this means a lot to me when I was growing up and you were pulling your own references into it. And um, it was one of the most thoughtful things I'd ever seen. So mental health being as real as it is, this is something that's also very important to us on the show. Um, Working at Henry's with Aurora, she's my store manager, by the way. Um, she's my boss, <laughs> but she's also on the board for the Henry's foundation for mental health. So, uh, Aurora, maybe you can quickly chat about that and explain yeah. why it is so important and why we back it so uh, as strongly as we do. And I know Mark, you have something you want to bring up as well after yeah. that. So, um, well, first thing I want to say before anything else, we're filming this on uh, international women's day. Yes. So, um, I know it's going to come out multiple weeks after that. Uh, but I just want to say happy international, happy late international women's day. <laughs> thank um, you. <laughs> um, we definitely I know you weren't calling me a woman and I had to say thank you for that, but thank you for mentioning it. So everybody knows that we I have the yeah. same thought process. I'm like, those aren't the right words I'm supposed to well, say. So I'm not going to say we're it. We're talking about the Me Too era and people taking yeah. advantage of women and, and, and all different things. And I felt like it was a good thing to uh, bring up international women's day. So for yes. sure. Cool. Anyway, um, talking about uh, the Henry's Foundation, um, so I don't know, was it two, maybe three years ago, um, the sister of the CEO of Henry's decided that she was going to launch uh, the Henry's Foundation, a foundation for uh, mental health um, in Canada, um, and uh, she released kind of the fact that she was doing this at a manager's meeting, and I right away was like, I need to be a part of this. However, I can, like, I really need to be a part of this. So, um, you know, months went by and she had gone all through the legal process. And um, now the foundation's been around since last February. So over a year now. Um, and basically Congrats. what we do. Yeah, I know. It's pretty exciting. I'm a part of two of the committees for it. Uh, the event planning committee and the um, marketing committee. Um, and I don't know, I, I find it is such an important thing. Um, so what we do is um, every time there's a donation made towards the Henry's Foundation, um, so we take donations in the store or on the Henry's Foundation website, on Facebook, like you can add it as a, a charity um, to donate onto posts and stuff like that. I'll Sweet. likely do that when we post these videos. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, um, all the donations go to uh, CAMH, uh, Kids Help Phone, Jack.org, um, and other Canadian mental health institutions in different areas of Canada. So there's uh, one in Vancouver, one in Quebec, one in Nova Scotia that we deal with. It's very localized as well. So uh, the two national partners, Kids Help Phone and Jack.org, uh, part of the donation always go to those two. So it's covering all of Canada. And then the other part of the donation goes to the local area in that area. So CAMH would be our area, but if someone donated in Vancouver, it would be VG UBC Hospital. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, so it's very cool. Um, and um, for me, it's a big thing because I have multiple relatives that have struggled with mental health, um, mental illness, mental health um, their entire life. I personally, ever since I was little, I struggled with anxiety. Um, and it was a big thing for me all my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I had this uh, experience that happened to uh, one of my close siblings uh, right around the time that the charity was being released and announced. Um, I had a relative, uh, a sibling stay in KMH for two, three weeks. Um, and that was you know, a big struggle for mm -hmm. me, but uh, them seeing them come out of it and how much they've improved and, and that kind of thing. It, it really, I wanted to support the cause. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's a thing. Another thing I think that links back to our conversation earlier about how people 
only share the best parts of themselves, um, especially on social media. Um, kind of sometimes people can be kind of cocky about it and, and yeah. that kind of thing. Um, we actually have a social media campaign um, called the Uncaptured Moments campaign, and it's okay. Uh, basically, the suggestion is for people to post um, a photo or a video uh, about what mental health means to them, but showing kind of the side that you wouldn't normally sh show mm -hmm. on social media. So if it's if you're having a bad day or you want to depict how a certain, you know, uh, you know, mental illness affects you. Um, I feel like this is a really great way to get that information out there and show people that it's OK to not be OK. Uh, so, yeah, that's my little speech on that. <laughs> I, I do want to say then for anyone that, because I'll do this as my part, because I I never know, like, what charities to support because you don't fully know the thing. And that's also, like, you bringing up the personal experience. A lot of people downplay mental health because they're like, well, I don't know anyone that suffers. It's like, you don't know because they don't let it out. And mm -hmm. I just want to say then if you're tagging that charity on Facebook that – uh, I will I will match any donation up to three hundred dollars. Like I'll donate on my own at least. Uh, I don't want to say how much, uh, but I'll donate my own. But if we can get three hundred people to donate when this episode goes up, I will match that so that there will be at least six hundred donated to the charity. Like just because wow. like I I love I love that initiative though, and that's the thing about me where it's my actions match my intentions. Everyone would be like, yeah, that's cool. Even Ryan and Brian can. <laughs> I just realized that rhymed. Uh, uh, but, but but they uh, they can attest. Literally, Ryan's name is just one more one less letter than Brian's. I just but, got uh, one extra letter. That's it. Uh, but like that's the thing of I said when I did my Indiegogo that the show was going to be released for free for everyone on Christmas Eve. But if you can financially support, you'll get perks with it. If you can't, just share it. And the amount of shares that got from wrestlers to promotions with something no one's seen before and i can honestly look at that and go no one else does that because they're constantly thinking well if they're shining that means i'm not shining it's like no bro it's a big spotlight a lot of people can shine at the same time and i i see how much that means so if this if my motivating someone and i, I guess i'll just say like i'll donate a hundred dollars whenever this episode airs no matter what but like if i can motivate people to donate 200 more than that then i'll donate an extra 200 just so that because it's going to a good place and it's someone that i can see that and that's i think that's what a lot goes back to what me and ryan were talking about earlier where people don't share it so you don't know about it and you think everyone's the same or sharing you said it best with they're sharing their best days on social media and there's there's another rap song that literally says like my best day uh someone's worst day is my, oh, I'm, I screw it up. Someone's best day is my worst day. And it's just sharing and stuff where, yeah, it's, you're seeing this slice of their life, this one nanosecond in 60 or 24 hours in a day. So I, I will at least match any donations up to 300 just to get a little more traction there. Cause like that, that's just a great thing. The fact that you're involved in, it. I love it. Thank you for, thank you for the hard work that you do on that side. Thank you. And she does. She actually does, which is which is great. Uh, she's inspired our whole store to do well with donations, and uh, New Market has been very generous. All the people that we have coming in through the store, so yeah, Aurora has done quite a bit for that. That's it's been great. Because you need those people. You need when you think everyone in the world is crappy, you see Aurora, and she's the one that's actually taking action and stuff. Everyone will say, "Find a charity." This goes back to that get help versus helping. Oh yeah, there's there's someone somewhere doing it. Well, can you do your part? Well, I, I don't have money, but I can donate my time. I could donate that way. So it's that finding. It's that hard work. Everything's about hard work in life. And sometimes getting out of bed is hard work. You mentioned anxiety and that where the biggest thing, people think depression is killing yourself. It's like, no, depression is not getting out of bed or just staying, removing yourself from social circles. So I, I love that foundation and how like organically it started and, your hard work. So I I don't know if enough people and I'm sure people do appreciate it and some of them don't say it but cuz that's the thing. Everyone will do a Yelp review about the frozen steak they got, but they won't do a Yelp review about the waiter that went out of their way to help them or the staff that made that awesome meal cuz good is expected. And unfortunately, <laughs> that 999,000 uh, out of that one in a million not appreciated. Nope. Nope. 
Mark, you uh, you're you're part of something as well where you work at Shoppers. Yes, that's um, I do work at Shoppers, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, and um, we also have uh, a charity that uh, we have. It's uh, the Run for Women, and it happens uh, July the fourth to the eleventh this year, um, and it's a virtual run because of COVID. Um, they did it last year virtually. Uh, and there was uh, lots of people did the run themselves. Um, they did socially distance and they had, you know, maybe one running partner and they raised money uh, for, for women's mental health charities. So um, each, uh, each run, there's 18 runs across Canada and each one of those runs, uh, the money goes to a local uh, mental health charity. Um, my group up here in uh, Thunder Bay in Northwestern Ontario um, are a part of the Ottawa run. Um, but the money from our team is going back into a, a, a women's charity here in Thunder Bay. So um, so that's great. Um, we've got, uh, I think there's 35 as of this afternoon, 35 people um, from my stores here that are are doing the run uh, and raising that uh, those funds for women's mental health charities. So uh, it's a great organization and it's something that uh, I know has been uh, near and dear to Shopper's Heart for uh, quite some time, the women's health charities. Um, and uh, with the pandemic uh, that shifted over to the mental health. So um, really excited to be a part of that. Um, and I'm not actually doing a run, I'm doing a 5K walk um, sometime during that week because uh, yes. I don't run. If you see me running, keep up because something bigger than I am is coming up behind me. So, but yeah, you don't really need to be fast. You just need to yeah. outrun Mark. That's right. That's right. Yeah, just outrun the slowest runner and you're good. But no, it's going to be a, a great day. And um, here in Thunder Bay, there's a, a park called Boulevard Park. And actually to do the circuit, if you leave the parking lot, walk around Boulevard Lake. When you go back to the parking lot, you've done exactly five kilometers. So, And what's uh, the dates what again? Sorry. July the 4th to July the 11th. Okay. So uh, looking forward to that. I'm going to, my wife and I are going out and we're going to take the dogs and uh, have a good day walking around the park. Awesome. All good causes, all good causes. And the whole point of us doing this show is to bring people up. And that's why Holden, I see your name on there. I'm calling you Holden now. I should never do that. This is actually funny. In wrestlers, in wrestling, you know, we know a lot of the people by their wrestling name. Very rarely do we talk, we do I call. I mean, I think it's a sign of respect. I have to know you a lot better before I start calling you your out of wrestling name. You know, it's just yeah. like you don't want fans calling you Brendan, right? But you spell Brendan. One, I don't care. Uh, yeah. I have so a podcast about this. Brendan. Brendan. That's a good yes, point. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but you spell Brendan with an E at the end, so everybody always says Brendon. What, what's up with that? I don't know. I think my parents wanted my life to be difficult from the moment I was born. Uh, <laughs> but but literally, it makes no sense. I even asked, and there's just no reason for it. And to make it even complicated more, like, so the last time I was on StreamYard, it was for a wrestling podcast. So my name's Holden there, because then they got confused of saying Brendan became unnatural to them because they wanted to interview the wrestler Holden Albright. So there's... A lot of things that I have, I'm listed as Brendan because I signed him with whatever email. That's why it's Holden on here, just to remind people. And also, like how I mentioned earlier about not remembering names, and like I, I need sometimes a little key card there to remember, remember <laughs> names. And, and literally, yeah, like I'm strange. Almost all of my friends have some form of their name in their name. Mark Wheeler's first name is Mark. Jody Threat, her first name is Jody. Stratos Fear. F E A R, not like the uh, the the NASA thing, uh, space. That's what I meant, not NASA. Uh, it, his real name is his short form of his first name is Stratos. Anton Alexiv, his name is Anton. My name is Brendan Caulfield, and my wrestling name is Holden Albright. And it's because in Catcher in the Rye, the main character's name is Holden Caulfield, and I am influenced a lot by a wrestler named Gary Albright. And my trainer offered me two choices. Gary Caulfield or Holden Albright? And Gary Caulfield sounds like someone that does like accounting. And I was like, oh, I'll go with Holden Albright. But that led to that first year of people going, hey, Holden. Hey, Albright. Yo, Albright. Albright. Brendan. I'm like, oh, okay. What? Because I just, I, it was unnatural to me. And then literally, it's, it's because of Facebook. Shane Savers specifically. I first added people on Facebook from wrestling training. And how people don't really know your name until you have like their Facebook profile and you see them constantly. They just read it how it is, B-R-E-N-D-O-N-E. -E, and they're like, Brendone. 
And what's weird is I've never been called Brendone in my life. I've been called Brandon, which there's no A's in my name. So that's my one pet peeve. If you call me Brandon and I don't like you, I'm probably going to reply with, that's not my name. Any it's other like, time. It's like when people say Sherbert. Sh- Sherbert. <laughs> there's no R. It's just Sherbet. So, Brian, I'm a little younger than you. I do. This is the first time I've heard the word sh- uh, oh. Sherbert and uh, frequently. <laughs> you know, I was shopping today and I was buying some Manwich. And here I am talking to these young kids that work at Loblaws. I'm like, can you can you tell me where Manwich is? They're like, what? Manwich? I'm old, okay? I eat Manwich. So for myself and Ryan and for the listeners, what is Manwich? I thought you were just saying you're building like a man sandwich. Like it just had every meat. It's like a sloppy joe. Wait, hang on, hang okay. on. You've never heard of Manwich? I haven't no. either. Oh. Oh, my head is exploding <laughs> right now. I, have heard of I think I'm also like, so... I'm thinking the exact same thing. No, no, what it is. Meat stacks of meat on the sandwich. (laughs) Brendan has has nailed it. He has called me, uh, what was it? What was Uh, he called? Yeah, Ryan is a middle aged white dude. He has a neighbor (laughs) that literally they were talking about recycling like wine bottles to the lcbo it was like i was looking and i think i literally compared it to like home improvement or something i realized that if i'm in a sitcom or a tv show it's like always sunny in philadelphia or like <laughs> or like a show I, I completely blocked on it oh um new girl like i'm in that mindset where it's ryan Great show. <laughs> ryan would be in like modern <laughs> Ryan would be in Modern Family. Like, he has neighbors he talks to. I have neighbors, but, like, I don't know any of them. And I like it that way. Like, I just see them. And then I find out my mom talks to people. And they'll be like, yeah, does your son work at, like, a funeral home? They're like, why? It's like, well, I saw him put a casket in his garage. And I'm like, oh, these people saw it. And then also, when wrestling was going on, I had this weird, I called it a trihawk, where it was like a mohawk down the center. But if you ever saw the Road Warriors or Legion of Doom, which was a tag team like 30 years ago, uh, that's how my haircut was. And I'm one of the strange people that I enjoyed when I got a fresh haircut. I would walk around a mall to get like those looks from people to be like, I think he's selling drugs or he's going to steal something where I'm just like, no, I'm just, I'm a crazy wrestler. Just trying to be the gimmick. <laughs> be the gimmick. I love That's it. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Anybody else have anything else to ask before we say good night to, to I'm going to call you Holden again. Cause it's right <laughs> yeah. there to Brendan. It is right, right there. It's right, right there. there. <laughs> that is a massive jug of water. You're drinking four liters. Four leaves. That's what I you gotta have one do. One thing to say, so to the people either listening or watching, if you're listening, there was a lot of image examples and um, you know interaction in the video. So if you want to watch the video, you can watch it on our YouTube channel for sure. Yep, definitely check out the YouTube channel. Uh, and if you liked our show tonight, please click like, subscribe to our channel, subscribe to our podcast. Uh, maybe give a quick comment. Let us know what you're thinking. There's always something interesting that we're going to talk about. And I think uh, as we go further with future episodes, you'll notice that, um, for example, today I kind of took the lead and I introduced you and I'm talking now and I'll probably close off the show because I invited you on tonight. Um, we're going to find that when the other uh, hosts invite their own people, they're going to be assuming that role as well. So we're going to have a nice rotation of uh, who's going to be talking too much and who's not talking enough. So I hope everything Speaking was good. Is my, is my guest next week? Um, I have to check that. I, maybe it's possible. You should know these things, Ryan. I know, but you know that I don't, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll work that out. But there's there's so many great things coming up in our future episodes, and I really want to take a, an extra minute here just to thank you, Brendan, for coming on tonight. Uh, again, I mentioned it before. You were the first person I wanted to come on this because uh, I've just seen you know, all the things that you've been doing, and, and you held up, man. You had great conversation. You, you made some really awesome points. Your, your challenge is fantastic. Dig deep into your emotion and try and ask yourself why you're feeling, how you're feeling. Uh, I really appreciate that. That was great. And for you to step up and, and offer to help out with the Henry's Foundation afterward, that's that just tells all kinds of things about what a, what an awesome guy you are, man. Well, I want to actually, I want to invite all of you guys where I basically want to recreate this, but where I take the lead and ask you guys questions and have a panel discussion on my podcast in a couple months. So I'm welcoming you guys on and people can't see this, but in the chat, we just had a mini conversation about age. I'm 28. (laughs) And I think that's one of the things where 
when people that are 20 or 30 years older than me go, oh, I wish I spent that time more. It's like age isn't a physical thing. It is a mental thing. And it's living within that of I have friends because of wrestling that are literally 16 year olds and not an inappropriate friendship to literally 50 years old. One of my best friends, Anthony Kingdom James, turns 50 real soon. And these are people that I interact because I get to learn from their experiences. And yeah, you might not be able to run as fast as you could when you were 20, but you have such valuable life experience that you've tried and hopefully failed on things because failing is how you learn. If you never fail, you don't know how lucky you are. It's all perception. So I, for anyone listening that because your age demographics are so wide, I want that to be a big takeaway also of age is a number, but don't let that be an excuse. Well, it is an excuse why I'm not wrestling. I'll give you that. Uh, <laughs> but you're taking dumbass photos that I'm resharing on my Instagram page. I love it. I love it. Are you going to well, say something, Ryan? Oh, oh sorry, I, I just said awesome. Oh, okay. I, I was a wrestler for seven days, actually, on a cruise. That was, uh, that was did, fun. It was, did your it was opponents actually, know? No, no. It was just one guy thought I was a wrestler the whole time. Every did time you get, he saw me, did you get yeah. uh, like perks, like free food or drinks? No, no, he was uh, one one drunk guy on the cruise. Every time he saw me, like you're a wrestler, aren't you? You're a wrestler. I'm sure I've seen you before, and I kept saying, "No, man, no, I'm not." Was it Ryan? And, uh, I, I know no. some cruise stories about yeah. Ryan being a drunk guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, been, I've been known to be uh, indulging on a cruise once or twice. <laughs> yeah. So finally, at the end of the week, I said to the guy, he, "He's like, he's like, no, yo, dude, you're a wrestler. I've seen you. I just can't remember your name." I go, I go, dude, dude, you got me. I said, I was just trying to have a a cruise, you know, with my wife i said you're right i'm a wrestler and he goes no oh, i do it and i said uh, I see, he goes he goes what was your handle you were the uh you were the and i go i go i was the garbage man and he goes oh yeah the garbage man the garbage man i go yeah he goes and your finishing move was and i go at the end of the ring i would pick up my opponent i'd throw him out of the ring i go i'm taking out the trash and every for the rest of the cruise he's like oh my god garbage man every time he saw me garbage man he'd be so, across the pool deck making a big you know, trying to say wrestling wrestling. fans are gullible. What's going on? Well, <laughs> well, it was awesome. well, my favorite tag team name combination, Brian and Ryan can uh, attest to this, that uh, he may have actually thought you were Duke, the dumpster drowsy from the rest of his life. Oh, there was okay. a wrestler who was a garbage man. And oh, wow. we have seen people specifically Eric Bischoff twice be thrown into a garbage truck. Oh. So <laughs> how bizarre wrestling is like you made up this yeah. scenario. This is like, no, no, no. I'm just no, going to be this guy. Mad yeah. <laughs> I'm going to play mad totally with feasible. experiences. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you've you've not met me in person, but I'm I'm also uh, I'm a pretty large fella. I'm just a, just a hair under 300 pounds myself, so it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty feasible to think. Yeah, yeah. I was a wrestler, you know, <laughs> or a football player, one or the other, but I was neither <laughs> ever. <laughs> All right. Well, that's about it for us tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for watching and listening to us. Again, if you appreciate what we were talking about, if you enjoyed our show, click like, subscribe, share this with your friends, and uh, don't forget to just be awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brendan. <laughs> Why do you got to have Holden up there, man? I know. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you, Ryan. You guys are awesome. I'm so happy to be doing this with all of you, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Take it. Ooh.